He's yelling at me like he used to yell at me. Don't burn the f***ing pizza. Listen, okay. if you put a calzone on that screen and do not forget about it. <laughs> Turn it into a cinder. <laughs> What is that? <laughs> what is that? I do want to hear that guitar part. <laughs> yeah, right on. So, hey, um, pandemic. Yeah, man. Ten weeks in now, something like that? Ten weeks? Craziness. So, you know, when it first started, we're like, all right, a couple weeks, you know, we'll be over it. But, you know, flatten the curve. Everything's going to be great. We flatten the curve. We're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? Like, everyone's like, you, no, we don't understand. You can't. <laughs> You can't just shut us down to the point where we can make no income. That's yeah. ridiculous. How do you, you know? Yeah. I don't know, man. It's kind of it's kind of hard to watch right now. I, well, from okay, so I'm in the real estate business, and we had our own unique obstacles in Pennsylvania, but nothing like what restaurants are going through. It's nothing pretty crazy, like. I must say. Like we know, I'm lucky enough to be involved with a lot of those guys from downtown. Right. Right. And we just did a dinner together. It was called we did we've been doing what we call the Italian barbecue with Justin from Cure. Yeah. He was the first one to really put it all together. Excuse me. <laughs> so we've been doing you can that. Do that here. <laughs> <laughs> it's to be that and so much more. <laughs> oh! Natalie Sugars isn't coming, is she? <laughs> no, no, she's due back on here when she gets back. Though. Damn. All right. Um, you want you want to be on that episode? I'll arrange that. <laughs> that would be hilarious. All right. I don't know if she really knows me. She might, but um, everybody knows you, buddy. I don't know about that. Mm-hmm. But Most anyway, of my guests do. Do they really? Yep. Oh, no. And at the restaurant, you and the restaurant. That's awesome. And That's some of it's from your joint work with other chefs downtown too. Yeah. And some of those projects. I'm lucky to be involved in that. To be honest with you, it's it, to me, it's so inspiring mm-hmm. to see. Man, these guys, like you know, I always thought I was okay at what I did. These guys are insane. They just have taken it like to the next level. I, I love what they're doing. <laughs> the it, creativity of it. Creativity, just they're just so passionate. And mm-hmm. it, it, sometimes you need to be around that. You know, for me to be around Certainly. young, passionate people helps me a lot. Yeah, that's that's good for us old guys it around is. younger. It people. really is. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. So, by the way, pandemic. Before I forget, because I will forget. Yes. Old brain. Uh, so, the the restaurant. I cannot imagine. Mike, now, how much takeout did you do before the pandemic? Well, we did it, but it was definitely not in our wheelhouse. It wasn't, we were, we were, man, we had a really good year last year. And we've had a few takeouts. We, it really wasn't something we did. Okay. I mean, it was almost a chore because we didn't have all the containers all the time, you know. So having to switch over to uh, straight up takeout was like, whoa, this is way different than what I'm used to. So you start to look at the menu because not everything travels well. Right. You know, right. there's stuff that doesn't make sense to, to put in a to go box. Mm-hmm. So we had to think about it for a minute, and the things that sell the best are the things that are sort of the staples on the menu. Right. So that worked out okay at that point. Hmm. Did you, you know, everything evolved. Uh, it was like a slow-moving train, so to speak. How did you manage the not knowing from week to week when, and we still kind of don't know. We really don't. We don't know what's what, and it comes down to one person's decision running this state, which is just mind-numbing to me. <laughs> Amazing. But uh, without the, the unknowing has to be a bitch. Well, and everybody, you know me, I'm just like, every time we get together, guys, well, you know, what are you thinking? You're like, you know, honestly, some of these guys are like, we're just not even going to open. Because when you open, you're going to be a 50% capacity. Hmm. If you've taken the, P, the, the, the Paycheck Protection Program money, have you heard of that? I have heard of it, yes. So, okay. So the, the point of it was you give us an average of what your monthly – uh, uh, salaries are and we will take care of eight weeks of that okay so then they put all these disclaimers in so they give you what that is and you have to use 75 percent of it to pay for labor which is kind of insane because you have this money and you have all these other expenses right. you know 25 percent doesn't work but they're back in talking about it because it makes no sense so the problem with that is so they're going to let us open next Friday mm-hmm. for outdoor dining at 50% of the outside space. Now, if, if the... <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's that? Four tables? I, I mean, mean like... yeah. I mean, because you figure six feet between people was like nine feet between tables. Uh-huh. 
So by the time you spread that all out, you know, you're not really, you're not really doing very well. And they expect you to hire your whole crew back in order to, to get that loan uh, dismissed. And you're going to be like at half capacity only outside. Right. And how do you pay for all these people? Because if that goes away, they're trying to read, they're trying to do another round of that. But if that goes away, well, you can't, I can't have that many. Nobody can. You can't have that many people around doing nothing. You know, it just doesn't work like that. So we're going to continue to do takeout and we're going to take whatever tables we can can. But we're not doing it the first week. We're going to wait. Like the first Friday is going to be next Friday. You know, we were talking today. I'm like, let's just see what happens after the first week. Interesting. I'll wait. You know, yeah, we'll do it the following week. Okay. But, but you never know. You know, you never know. They change their mind every 35 seconds. Around Half here. capacity of outdoor seating only. That's that's how you have to start the process. Yeah. So we have about 24 seats out there. So we'll be able to seat 12 at a time. Mm. <laughs> well, my overhead, my and my, my fixed costs don't change. So, mm-hmm. you know, so here you are with a full, you know, full labor. Right. Th- same fixed cost yep. and the ability to make about a quarter of what you normally would make with the inside and out. You know? Wow. So, we've had uh, a lot of guests on here who were small business people, entrepreneurs, and I had an observation that I ran by them all, and I want to run it by you. We're pretty polarized in this country, left and right, and you know that's that's politics. But there was a different divide this time. Mm-hmm. It was the divide of entrepreneurs and business owners, small business owners. And those who were employees for companies or had had regular paychecks yeah. or, or so it, it all their Harrisburg's decisions almost pitted those two groups of people against each other. Would you Ab- not agree? Absolutely. Their yeah. experience is way different. You know, uh-huh. when someone takes away every opportunity for you to even earn a living. Right. You know, when as, as a business owner, we pay into unemployment, but we can't take unemployment. So all of a sudden, you you have fixed costs that don't go away, mm-hmm. you know, and there's no way you, you're not allowed to open f- to make any income. Right. Wow. Yeah. You know. And I think that's where the divide. Wow. Is. Yeah, because pay, like you know, the same thing. When in Swickley, a lot of people working from home, their their income hasn't changed. They're a little bit inconvenienced because they can't go out, but they're they mean they're they're not worried about money. Right. You think about fixed overhead, all the people that work for you. You know, that's even another story, man. That unemployment where they gave an extra six hundred dollars a week. Mm-hmm. So you have people that are making more than they ever made on unemployment. Are they going to come back? <laughs> well, I have to say, I have to give Your my people may, I have but, to say, my crew was yeah. when we told them that there was no problem. I understood. I I yeah, really yeah. really respect them for that. Sure. Because we were making no money. We're like guys. We've been we've been just really battling over whether we should take this or not right we don't want to but we were thinking this was going to be three weeks you know something like that great we could have been no problem now we're coming up on three months mm-hmm. there's just not we have no way you know we had no income ourselves at all wow and they're like no problem so that was encouraging yeah and 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 I, and I, you know, I'm on social media a lot. This particular show is social media based, so naturally I'm there. But the divide is so interesting. It's not left or right per se. It no. really comes down to entrepreneurs versus soured employees, or people that are receiving government benefits in some capacity that have regular money coming in. And of course, those folks are ultra scared. We're scared too. But you know, it's easy for those folks to say, "Well, you know, let's just." Let's just have our stay at home order for another couple of months yeah. because we want it to go away. Yeah, but that's see, I think they're I think it's they're, crazy. I think they're giving you a false narrative. Look, no question. We have been no through, question. How many viruses have we been through? Mm. We don't have anything that destroys AIDS yet. We don't have anything for SARS. So I think what they're trying to say is, listen, we can't do anything until we get to the point where nobody gets it. That's never it's going nuts. to happen. That's nuts. That's impossible. Mm-hmm. But if they keep saying it enough, you have people to believe it. Right. You know, like today, as a matter of fact, I was sitting on a, on my courtyard and I was talking and these two ladies that come to the restaurant pretty often and both had masks on. And they're like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to open up? I'm like, nah, I think we're going to wait a week. She goes, good. Because I saw people walking around town with no masks and no gloves on. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Might have been me. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably me. Probably me. <laughs> and so, you know, you, I don't know. They're not, it's not that they're, not smart people. Right. But well, they're you, afraid. They're afraid. The narrative is based on fear. Exactly right. And how do you control the populace? Fear. Fear. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way. You know, I'm thinking the beginning, they made it sound so horrific just so they got your oh, attention. I was scared. First couple how weeks. How could I you was, not be? I mean, Two million, three million dead. I mean, holy shit. 
Yeah. You know. And it turned out that this was a fast spreading disease, but primarily the the gravest part of the disease is affecting those at the highest risk factor. Exactly. And you didn't hear that till way on into no. this thing. And we could have gotten that information because those that data must have been in Italy and has to be in China, right? Why weren't be. we told that? See, that's what I'm trying to say. You can't get three people to agree, and all of a sudden the whole world agrees. And if you look at some of the countries, Italy was on its ass already, mm -hmm. Greece on its ass already. They're like, hey, what the hell? What can we, let's let's just go with it. And then even to go more conspiracy, which no, is yeah, really yeah, no, that's all right. Hey, you guys, this, <laughs> we're here to do is talk our minds. I, I, I Italy though for a second, because that's a, that's a hit home for you. Yes. And Greece, yeah, and you're you're for the most part. You have a shit ton of smokers there. They still smoke as part of their culture. We've kind of eradicated. You're talking about smoke. in Italy, yeah, yes, absolutely. They all. You have multi generational uh, living in houses, absolutely. right? Absolutely. We generally don't have that across. Getting the back, we're getting to it. Though. We are <laughs> but across the whole country. Generally, mm -hmm. you know, the Midwest is not like New York and L.A. No, or Miami or Chicago. No. no. So you had that. And there's a and apparently Italy has an aged population. It really does, and so that you know that contributes a lot to their numbers. Right. Plus, from what I understand, Milan has a direct line to China for their uh, fashion. Mm -hmm. So they get all the fabrics. So that travel was that was a lot oh, of travel back and forth. Interesting. From Italy. Interesting. And again, it's like you know, I, I, you know, if you start to think about it, so what, what's the common thread? How do you get the whole? Either it's way worse than they tell us, or the numbers aren't adding enough for that. Mm -hmm. So, or there's a common thread that the whole world decided now's the time to do this. So they all hate Trump. Mm -hmm. A lot of them hate Trump, or they might not hate him, but he's really difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is the time to try to see if we can get rid of that, or maybe the green movement. You know, like what what was the common thread? You mm -hmm. know, unless it was just the most unknown thing that possible. But with today's technology, I'm having trouble believing that. Good point. And coronavirus is listed on Lysol cans yes. for the past six or seven years. Yes. It's not a quote unquote new strain it's of not. disease. It's just a morphing of the whatever it started out to be. And see, mm. so there has to be a reason why the whole world decided to tank all their economies. How is that possible? Mm -hmm. Again, unless it's so horrific and maybe... A year from now, it comes out. Well, we didn't want to say this, but actually, fifty million people died. <laughs> you know, I don't know. We do, well, and that another good point too. You know, you're here. You are a business owner, the <clears throat> extremely successful and popular restaurant here in Pittsburgh, and you have to make day to day decisions on how to quote unquote survive, survive, literally with, survive, right? With information that is so contradictory, you, you look to you look. So we're in Pennsylvania friends and we look to ohio and the and we're not too far from ohio <laughs> but their whole strategy to handle this as a state is completely different than what we're doing how can that be possible that's what i'm trying to say well you know the funny part about this when they said flatten the curve that didn't mean that the people that were supposed to get it that were vulnerable are not going to get it they just tried to slow it down mm -hmm. i believe and this is only my opinion that if it would have just got left alone it would have spiked and came down we just said wow that was a bad flu season and it would have been gone. But we're dragging it out. We're using it for political reasons now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a shame because mm -hmm. the, the red and blue states, like, it's amazing. The blue states, did you ever see that? The differences did between you the see two. That? Yeah. The, and mean, they were pointing toward the governors. The governors of the blue, the blue governors in blue states compared to red governors in red states and how they handled the differences, but then the results. The results are what matter, horrifying. you know? Horrifying. Horrifying. Yeah. yeah, it looks like the, the blue states, they have way higher death rates than the red states did. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the only way you're going to make this go away, or at least if you're telling us that every time this happens, we have to shut the whole freaking world down, we yeah. might as well just give up now. Yeah. Oh, there, there's, it's going, things like this are going to happen. They've been happening. We've been living with mm -hmm. this shit forever. Well, there was SARS and there was a bird with flu and all kinds of crazy. I mean, we, you know, you heard about it, you heard about it on the news and, you know, I think it was the rapid nature that it was spreading. I think because of tech, was... because of the the new technologies and the internet and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, that, I'm sure that has a lot to do with it. Now, the concept of conspiracy is kind of lost on me, only because it's hard to for me to wrap my head around the fact that such a large amount of people can 
be in cahoots to implement something on a worldwide basis. I'm I not agree. against it. I-, I agree with you, but where is the common thread? Okay, well, here's my idea. Ah, here's right. my idea. All this right. is, and I actually, just, I actually, it's my own critical thinking. <laughs> yes, I critical. tried to. Maybe this is a crisis or an unknown event that's happened, and it came on so quick that maybe just the two political mindsets in the country or the two political philosophies tried to co-opt the crisis to fit their narrative. I'll go with that. That sounds fine, you know, but but the whole world, Eric. Yeah. Well, yeah. most of the world is liberal, right? Yeah. Outside of this country there you go. And, and maybe a couple select northern european countries so now you're pretty much saying what i'm trying to say is i don't know what do all what do all people with that mindset what's the common thread what do they want they want the green movement and they they live in fear they live in fear and they hate trump Mm -hmm. as the leader of the free world well because with him in power their lives are miserable (laughs) (laughs) they don't have to be miserable that's a choice that's a choice for god's sake what i'm trying to say he comes along say we're not giving you any more money for (laughs) you know that shit you did for all those years well that shit's over they're like oh no oh we're not going to change you see what i mean he comes along and changes the game no 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 i i get that wholeheartedly and you know you think about shit that you know governments have done they've done horrific shit killed people blown shit up I mean, just our to own get, government's done our it. own government just to try to steer the population in one whatever you know whatever they're trying to do, and they can do that just by a couple of quick moves, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> holy yeah. shit! Yeah, we're not in control. No, we, we want to believe that that vote we do, you know, and, I don't and think all so. That. We're, we're not in control. We're not in control. I mean, Trump is just a maverick. You know, they don't. They're not used to that shit. People go there and fall in line. They're yeah. like, okay, you're the president now. We understand yeah. you have these beliefs, but what you're going to do from now on is you're going to do this. Uh huh. And if you do that. It's going to be great. And Trump's like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, they don't like that shit. <laughs> well, and, and love him, hate him, indifferent to him. Absolutely. The, the, the one thing no one can argue who's been paying attention is that he is so unconventional and he's not a politician. He's not. And he's not. He is an outlier. He really. And that's what I'm trying to say. Think about the leaders of the world that were able to get oh, in cahoots immediately with whatever president. They must be horrified. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, virus. All right, time to get. This is what we do, guys. We just shut shit down until he decides to go. <laughs> oh, I, one of the craziest things I think was when he went over to greet the royal family over and over. I mean, like you know, he didn't follow any decorum <laughs> protocol. I mean, this is the president who actually said months prior that Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols is one of the most legendary singers in the world and he really loves him. He said this. He did and, then say he goes and, and then he goes and meets with the queen. Right? I mean, you got to be kidding me. They're used right? to that pomp and circumstance oh and my God. this is the way you act and this is the way you talk. I guess he didn't is... bow right yeah. or you know, patted the queen on the back or gave her a bear hug. I don't know what the fuck so he here's did. where society is. Hey, Eric, I was in my studio, and I just invented a cure for cancer, proven. Mm-hmm. And I put a little little blurb out, and I spelled cancer wrong. Like, <laughs> look at that idiot. <laughs> he spelled cancer wrong. Not, the, the idea that cancer was cured has nothing to do with it. He spelled cancer wrong. Yeah. But that's where we're at. That's it. There's uh, no critical thinking. No, that's where and, we're and at. And we rush to extremes, yes. too. Would you not agree? Yes. It's I mean, like, like if, 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 if <laughs> it's so... Let's give, let me give you an example. So <laughs> you 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 run a restaurant. Your online reviews are tremendous. Uh, you know, I, we'll talk more about the restaurant later. But you know, the internet's a scary place for restaurants because you're not in control of reviews. You're if really you not. Care to, if you care to be cared about it, or if you care to pay attention to it, yeah, you're not really in control of that, right? You're really not. Well, when we first opened, we had a man. We were honestly when we got there, I went from reservations knowing exactly how many people were coming at night mm-hmm. we show up and swickly open up the first day we had 30 reservations did 120 people right. i was like what the fuck is going on <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like no wait no, wait a minute what do you mean they just showed up what uh-huh. and so it took us a minute to catch on so we had a couple of bad reviews and uh there's people come like man you got some bad reviews Use this company will help you get rid of them. i'm like i don't want it like that yeah you know yeah. if i'm if it's a bad review right and i deserve it i'm okay with it right but i'm gonna fix it i don't want to fix it by you fixing mm-hmm. it i want to fix it because now people are saying the right thing about it got it and i'm glad we did it that way because i mean you have those companies that will help you clean up your name online i mean what does that mean 
Like, what does that mean? What are you, you're still a jerk, but it doesn't look bad. Well, on... and also though, I think we're in a culture too where everybody jumps to extremes. Like, if you know, you go to a restaurant and have a bad meal, although you had seven great meals there, and one thing wasn't it wasn't even bad. Something was overdone. Whatever, or, yeah, or whatever. And maybe a waiter, you know, bumped into you or something by mistake. They go right to an extreme like they had a horrible meal. Right. And so you're fighting that, and that's not just for restaurants. I think I think that's human nature today. It really we is. just jump to extremes. It really is. Well, the thing about it is, the difference now is they're not just trying to tell you, hey, man, like those people, like, hey, man, we listen, we're not complaining, we're just telling you this. Right. These people go online, they literally try to destroy your business. Cancel culture, pal. Yeah, and they try to destroy your life, and they yeah. try to do... They're not trying to just be <laughs> objective about it. They're just like, no, you got to go. My steak, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's horrible. A, it's a cancel thing. And, and um, I had a guest on um, yesterday, Alex Simmons. We talked a little bit about comedians. You know, like Eddie, oh my Mur God, Eddie imagine? Murphy's paying the price to a degree for what he said. On delirious and all the stuff that you and I used to watch on the oh pizza shop. <laughs> so, but I mean, like, can you really criticize him today, thirty years later? Because he says, "Look, I, I view life differently." I, How I've, can you I've, do that? We've all grown, well, and society's moved forward. Absolutely, you know. And, and he he basically has said, paraphrasing, but you know, I've been introduced to a bunch uh, to a bunch of gay and lesbian folks that have become wonderful friends of mine, and I I look at that differently now. And I probably would, I know I wouldn't say that today in today's you know, comedy. To me, he shouldn't have to say that. No. Because if it's fucking funny. It's funny. Why is there limits on that, right? Well, and if you look at, who was it, Chris Rock? He said he's not going to ever play uh, colleges anymore. He said it, it's a, they, everybody's offended. They're looking to be offended. They're just waiting to be offended. They're not enjoying the show. They're not trying to laugh. They're just trying to catch you, like I said, cured cancer, but he's still cancer. <laughs> Fuck him. Did you see Dave Chappelle's show? Oh, the yeah. The opening monologue? Yeah. He, talk, he talks about the, how hard it is to play <laughs> For these for these new crowds, <laughs> yes. and, and it's you. <laughs> but like, he's well, right. He's right. Like you mean we can't laugh at anything anymore? So okay, so there you go. All of a sudden, if you look at any culture throughout history that their speech was controlled, it didn't end well for that for that population. Yeah, you can't take the comedians away from our society. Can't do it. But we need to laugh. But I don't know. Well, they try. Saturday Night Live, I think, had a young man they hired uh, about eight months ago. And over the weekend, a censor or something. Well, over, the, over the weekend, uh, that his first gig, someone found a tweet or a video where he made an off-color Asian joke years prior, and they canned him. But the next week, Eddie Murphy returned to host Saturday Night Live, and and I have Eddie Murphy's first couple records. He's badass, man. You know, and back then, I think everybody laughed at it. I think, I think most people laughed at it. Right? I think so. Well. But, <sighs> And I don't know what hurts anymore. And I, I'm, I'm sensitive, and I don't want to hurt somebody. But quit being so damn offended by everything. Yeah, if you're offended it's by insane. everything, we can't even talk. No, no. And here's the other thing I think, too. It's like, I don't know. Like, it's amazing how it, they, we have to have some kind of a way of knowing what all these different groups want you to call them at any given moment. It's getting crazy. It's getting crazy. I, I, listen, I, you look like a girl to me. i you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But some of them want to rip your face off. Like, how yeah. can you assume that I'm a girl? Well, yeah. I know a lot about girls, and you yeah. look like a girl. <laughs> and he does know a lot about girls. <laughs> but, but what I'm trying to say is... I... <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not for going out and, and purposely hurting anybody. No. I just don't know why. I mean, George Carlin, could George Carlin play today? <sighs> Ooh, it might could Lenny something. Bruce play today? <laughs> I don't or, know. Or Pryor? Crook, a Pryor. Oh, my God. You, I was listening to some of his stuff the other day. Oh, my God. Red Fox? <laughs> <laughs> Could those guys play today? And you know, they're st you can still watch some of that stuff on, on TV. It was I mean, funny. It's just funny. No one was offended by it. Yeah. And, well, and the thing is, though, if you're going to pay the money to go see a comedian, like if, if I'm going to pay money to go see Chappelle... I want to kind of know what I'm going to get, Exa oh, right. and I don't want him to hold back. That's a, that's a very good point. Like you know what you're getting into, mm -hmm. so don't go. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you don't like it and you expect everybody to just take it away and yeah. throw it away because you are offended by it, right. what kind of society is that? That's Do you have any issues with? Because um, I have a lot of friends that are vegetarian, and I kind of believe it. 
that it, that it can be done correctly can be a tad bit more healthy for you. Uh, definitely. I think so. Uh, but, we do okay with it, actually. Uh, well, my question is, though, do you have anybody that – because I was in a restaurant um, in Maryland once that – there was a, uh, but apparently it was a militant vegetarian sitting at a table about three over from mine. And by her table, a gentleman got served a big T-bone, which looked amazing. <laughs> she went ballistic. <laughs> she had to watch somebody eat the T-bone while she was having her dining experience. Yeah, I, I mean, don't go to the restaurant. It was a steakhouse. <laughs> well, I think what we should I mean, come do. Come on, right? What we should do is get about ten guys and go to a vegetarian <laughs> restaurant and tell them we want fucking meat. <laughs> And be offended if we don't get the meat. Oh, that's right, damn it, that's right. Two can play that game. I, 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 but I mean, uh, I just think, and look, I'm for anyone being who they want to be. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. But don't expect the world to know that, the, how many genders are in New York? Did you ever look that up? No, probably quite a few. It's like 75? Oh, look it up. On. Eric, look it up. Wait, I'm, wait, I'm look genders? Right. Wait, wait. <laughs> Well, gender right. is a male or female. I got but you. I, but I do understand. <laughs> no, 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 no. I do understand that biologically. How many genders are in New York? Biologically, there's anomal- anomalies. Um. That's impossible. <laughs> so, can I read some of them? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to start at the top. So, here's the list. Okay. Bi gender, cross dresser, drag queen, drag king. Femme queen, female to male, FTM, gender bender, pan gender, transsexual, transsexual. So you're transsexual, uh, and then you're transsexual slash transsexual. So I don't know. Is that like I'm a, not sure is that that a multiple transsexual? <laughs> Trans person. Uh, oh, look, woman, man. Okay, so that's in there. Butch, two spirit, trans, agender. Third sex, gender fluid, non bi transgender, and androgen, gender gifted, gender blender, femme, person of transgender experience, androgynous. And I think that's a short list. I think there's actually more. So None of that's a gender. So, as a society, we're supposed to no. understand what all those things that's are. That's my point. How so, do I know? So, you need 31 restrooms there. That's what I'm, <laughs> that's what I say. I don't care about any of this, honestly. Hey, you could be whoever you want. It honestly doesn't offend me. Yeah, I don't give a shit what anybody does. But you made a good point. The problem comes when the government gets involved and says, oh, guess what? Three different bathrooms isn't enough anymore. You have to have a fourth one for right whatever the fuck. And see, I don't care about this. Honestly, I'm not offended by it. You be who you want. I'm okay with you. Never judge yeah. you on it. As long as they wash their hands coming out, I don't it's give a, a shit what they're, they're doing, do. what they're doing. Right but isn't now. that like, amazing that you would hear that? And that's that's recognized in New York. I mean, it, and, and you know what's funny? <laughs> I don't know how you feel. You're slightly older than I. <laughs> I won't bring that up again, but just slightly. <laughs> but, you know, we've been around long enough to like be kind of really confused about a lot of shit that's happening today. Absolutely. Okay. So and not because I'm closed minded. No. I don't get it. No, I don't get it either. And I you know, biology is like biology to me. And I know there's anomalies, you know, people born with different multiple sex organs. Sure. I get all of that. Sure. And those people have a rough life because sure. I'm sure they're struggling internally. I have compassion. But I don't have tolerance for stupidity. Yep. And half the things on there are chosen genders yes. based based upon, I don't know, la di da, whatever. I, I feel like being an elephant like today. Being yeah, there. yeah, so, exactly. And and it's it's funny. Like I, I remember posting something in humor once about like I you know, I, I think it was recently I said something. I've decided that I'm going to associate myself <laughs> as a hibiscus plant, <laughs> and I want to be referred as chlorophyll from this point. And it was funny, but I had a couple of 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 my. A homosexual friends uh, that really took offense to it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, on no, they not what they didn't private message me. They went on there. Oh my god! And I just I don't have time to address it. I mean, I'm, nah, I, you know, you're it better is, off. It is what it is. You're I, better I, off. You know, and I love. I still love them, but but my God, what? Are you looking to be offended? Yes. Really? The only I don't thing I want to hurt anybody. Well, I'm look, just confused. 
How could you not be I'm confused? confused. I, mean, I mean, I think, you know, you see these movies in the future, and I had a young kid that worked for us for a while, and he was so liberal. And we're, I'm, we were talking about freedoms. I'm like, we're getting to the point now when you're born, you're going to have a chip stuck in you, and uh-huh. then when you leave your door in the morning, this is already on a movie. I can't remember which one it was. They're going to just download everything that you're allowed to know or <laughs> like or be or mm-hmm. do. That way we're all on the same page. So That's we walked down. Insanity. Because if you don't do that – you're going to know anybody this somebody walks in that room you're going to know he's a whatever the heck he was he was transsexual transsexual <laughs> like what does that mean well, how can you be a transsexual transsexual so <laughs> so it's for our audience um <laughs> i i be, worked for sam when i was 14 i should probably shouldn't state this with our current state ah, government right? go ahead 14 years old um and in my first job, my first job, it was at a pizza shop here in Coriopolis, Sabatino's. Yeah. And I was so thrilled to have that. But, it was, <laughs> but, but I always lament. I learned about customer service. I learned about just just dealing with the public from you, which has served me so well in my life. Oh. There's the compliment. Here's the second part. All right. Second part of it was, that was 81 I started. Early 81. January of 81. Oh my God. I was just out of the Marine Corps at that time. I got out in 80. Uh-huh. 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 Mm-hmm. Well... I remember I handed a pizza over the counter to a woman, a very attractive woman, probably mid thirties, I'm guessing. Remember this is clear as a bell. And when I took the and she and and I said I said, Ma'am, have a nice night and she went off on me for calling her a ma'am. Oh, because she was young. I, I well no, I, I don't know what the reason was and I was really like and, and when she left you pulled me aside and said, Hey, have you ever heard of women's liberation? And I go, no, I have not. He goes, well, go look it up in a library. We go to school tomorrow. But don't worry about it. Keep doing that. Absolutely. But you're always you can't please everybody. Mind you, you can't. So, and you know what? Years later, when I had a desk job, I thought of you in that circumstance where in the late eighties I was in Moon Township somewhere at an airport office park, and there was an elevator. And I remember. I was holding the elevator door at the same time that this woman reached for the elevator door, and she goes, "I can take care of my my own elevator. <laughs> I can take care of the elevator on my own. Thank you." Oh. oh, and it was really you know you had those moments. It doesn't happen often, nope, but it was it a doesn't. little moments as a, as a younger person you learn that there are movements that are powerful and they do they do kind of. Um, I don't know. They rear their ugly head they in do. social circumstances, and it's done to belittle the other person. It really is, and it's, and it's it's a hard it was a hard lesson for me to learn because I want to be nice to everybody, right? It's, it's a weird thing. Like feminism, look at what's happened to that. Oh my God! It's, it's what does that even mean anymore? It doesn't mean anything anymore. I mean, I I love it. assertive women, women who have yes. great careers, carry themselves great, and hold conversations. Who usually way smarter than most men I've ever met, including myself. Yep. But if you're going to use it as a weapon, you weaponize you it. You do weaponize I don't it. get it. You know, all of a sudden, if you want to stay it. home with your kids, you're, you're, what are you? You're a failure. And meanwhile, there's women that want to stay home with their kids. Yeah, we could use a little more of that in society a based lot upon more some of the me. kids. I'd say that that is a big problem of what's happening right now. We were lucky enough to have. Yes, we were. Uh, you know, like when we were in Bellevue, a lot of my daughter's friends were not married. They were divorced. And it's... Um, it's not good, you know, no matter how you look at it. No, no divorce, especially when children are very young, is, is the, the toughest way to go. I think so. And, and ha, you ha, the best case scenario is to have two parents who really understand that and then work together for a long period of time exactly. to make it right. Exactly right. That's a rare circumstance. It's rough, man. It's like, you know, I don't, I don't, I think in, it looks like society is actually trying to steer everybody away from that. You know, if you look at welfare, they replace the male with welfare. So all of a sudden you don't even need a male. You don't need a, you don't need a father now. We, we got whatever we need. I, well, it takes a village, right? Well, I remember growing up, man. <laughs> it, it, it was a village it in was, Corey Hoppers, you right? Wa- you walked down the street and screw around, and whether that old woman was a black woman, Italian woman, or Chinese, she'd come, come over and smack you upside your head. Yeah, I, I remember saying, uh, I know your mother, Cheryl. Uh, Believe me, I'm calling her yes. now. And that's why it worked. It did work. That's, it, that's a village that took care of yeah, itself. Yeah, you know, it wasn't anything. There was... You know, I don't know. It's so hard to say what I'm going to say because, you know, Coriopolis was about half and half, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Never had a pro- – we never – it's – I said the same thing on this show. It's funny you brought that up. I, I've said that multiple times to guess that, that we didn't have those racial issues in this town. Until Martin Luther King. 
Okay. Because I remember we went through some pretty bad You're shit. You're older than me. Yes. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, when was, wait, was it Martha Luther King? Yeah. I mean, I just think that race relations. Or Rodney got, King. But that we were, you, you and I were long gone by then. Yeah, we were, I was married during that. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. You were talking. No, I, 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 well, okay. So I'm 54. So my, my formidable years were probably 77 through 83. I had no racial strife in my life whatsoever, and 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 I had two two amazingly loving parents that did not care about the color of skin of any of my friends. No, none of them. So, and it was really, and if my friends, if you disagree, I you know maybe I, my memory's not that great, but I I don't remember racial strife at all. I just don't. Now, when I got out of high school, the world smacked me in the face, especially in corporate America, and, some other, and once I got some. Business friends in business uh, who were African American, I learned and I learned about because we we really didn't hear about that stuff outside of slavery in, in textbooks. Yeah, but exactly. it wasn't it wasn't real to us. It wasn't. I mean, it was not unusual for you know me and God. This sound every time I say this, I feel like people are like, oh, oh great, this is a so cliche for you to say this, but we lived it. I mean, yeah, I had. I was around black friends all the time. We'd come over to the house. My, they my mother. They always had the best music. But you know, we always did. But you know, we always listened to the same music in, my, in high school. Yeah. It didn't matter what color you were. Yeah. But it wasn't unusual to walk in with a couple of my friends, and they would just sit down at the table and start eating. And if I go to their house, you know, I yeah, had, ended up same, having some oh. food that I never would have thought I had. Yeah. And it wasn't. It was yeah. no problem. I don't understand it anymore. And I and I feel blessed that I was I wrote was raised in this town. I went through a, a, a Sam went through a long period where I never wanted to come back to this town. I had some I had some bias against it. Once one maybe it was arrogance. I got out to Robinson, lived in Mount Lebanon for a while, and I just didn't want to come back here. And now that I am living back here, it, it's changed my perspective. And it's not a perfect area by any means, but I do have an appreciation. And I I've watched my children grow up in Moon Township, not the most racially diverse. No. And, and I've done my darndest to make sure that my kids have the right perspective. And you know. Hopefully they do, but uh, but they'll make their own decisions. It's all about the individual. It, it absolutely is. If you're an asshole and yeah. you're black, you're an asshole. If no you're question. an asshole and you're Asian, you're just. It, I don't care yeah. what color you are. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's not the point. But unfortunately, it, that's where it's taken automatically. Yeah. You know, if you say something, you know, whatever against a black person, oh my God, you're so racist. And, yeah. No, I'm not racist. He's just a fucking asshole. Yeah. yeah. You know. And, and, and well, there's assholes on every every yeah, persuasion. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you just have to understand that it's got nothing to do with your race. Right. It's just you're just a fucking asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're out there. I don't care if you were white. I'd still say you're a fucking asshole. <laughs> and there's plenty of those out yeah, there too. I can just, tell you. But uh, man, it's amazing how that's just been taken well, away. We're all polarized right now. So polarized. Yeah. I think that's. By design, does that you know? I divide so. and conquer is, is is an ancient theory that always works. Well, there is certainly folks in power in our government and business who think that the society is better when we're all fighting. Well, because it's easier to control. Right? Yeah, you're right. Because you can just say, okay, hey, this group needs this. Let's give that group them. They'll vote for us and keep us in. This group needs that. So as soon as you start uh, dividing us between class and all that, mm -hmm. it's easy because now you can target a particular group to give Amen. them things or, or take things away. or Because if we're just Americans, how do you control that? You can't. Right. You can. That's, that's a really good point. That's the only thing that they. That's if you look at it, it's exactly what's happening. I mean, uh -huh. you know, the Mexicans need this, and the Italians need that, and the backs need this. So whoever they think that they're going to give that to, they think that they're going to get block. voting block. But if you look at poverty, I mean, Jesus, poverty's been how many billions, if not trillions, of dollars have we spent on it, and those numbers have not changed. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure the percentage of people in poverty is pretty similar to what it's always been. Well, I don't think that you can legislate morality, but no. also I don't think you can – you can't legislate drive. You cannot create an internal spark in a human being no. by legislation that's going to make them change their life and, and be industrious and hold a great job and raise a great family or start a business. You can't legislate drive. No, it's just – it's not their fault. You know, they have no real role models and yeah. no one's pushing them to be better and – it's kind of sad, you know. Well, it's always nice to hear when people break out of that. And, no question. And they get and there's away. There's a lot of stories of success. There's that come a good. Out there's there. a good amount yeah, of that. They're rising above. But I think what we didn't grow up with, and even I mean, the technology and internet and all that. I mean, it just allows. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> it, it's just a lot. I wouldn't want that shit oh when we were. God. <laughs> could you only imagine? Oh no. <laughs> We'd be in jail. <laughs> 
Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, if we had if we had Twitter and Facebook and phones that would record, could you imagine <laughs> the shit that we did that we would have, out of our own stupidity, right. would have filmed? Oh, yeah. And then we'd probably be arrested today There's for no, whatever. Uh, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> 30 years ago you did this? You're still under arrest. <laughs> yeah. It's cancel culture, buddy. It's just it's just rough. It's just I think that what it does is just allows information to get out there so quickly. I mean, you can get a group of like-minded people to either do harm or good together with one right. tap of a button. Right. You know, you can let a million people know you're going to be at this place at this time and we're going to do this. Yeah, try that. You know, when we were growing up, trying to get four people get ready to go out at one time on a phone was a chore. That's right. I mean, trying to get four of your friends to be at a certain place at this time. That's right. You had to wait, and you, you had, had to, to wait a, for the phone call You had back. to put a little plan together, yeah. maybe write down the details of it and the whole thing. I mean, you had to... <laughs> the good part was, if you told someone you're calling them at six, you called them at six. Yeah, we were more accountable than You had to be. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the, world, the, the world actually ran on accountability then to. because yeah. you had no choice. You had no choice. And, and, and it's funny, too, like I... You're employing employees now, so you're you're an employer. Something has definitely been different in regards to job importance, meaning that the jobs I had as when I was younger, even all the way to when I left corporate America and did my own thing, I revered the job I had. And I'm not putting myself on a pedestal because there was days I didn't want to go to work. But there was an importance, and I felt an, a, a level of responsibility to my employer right. to at least show up, if not do the best I can that particular day. But I would put the effort in, and that is kind of odd now. Yeah. And I'm not sure. Uh, right? You know, we've been lucky. All of our employees are very conscientious of what they're doing. Okay. You know, they we, we treat them well. Try to pay them as much as I can, and right. they know it. You know, right. they know what other people in this in, in, are getting, and they realize that they're getting pretty much a top of the pay scale for what they're doing. And I think that right now, if you look at some of these young folks, they don't even know the very basics of going to work. You know, be on time, even be a little bit early, you know, be ready to start at whatever time. Mm -hmm. it, that doesn't matter to them, I think, for whatever reason, maybe good, you know, I don't know. I blame well, my generation. I think we were shitty parents. Yeah, maybe. I, I do. I think, we're, I think we're shitty parents and we didn't instill that same, because we had it. That well, so you were trying to give them a better life, a cushier life than you had, you know? And you're on to something because yeah, yeah. I've said that a million times too. Like you wanted, we wanted more for them than what we had, and in turn, we made them soft. My kids, man, they were so funny. Like we started playing, I started playing checkers with my youngest daughter. I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna kick your ass. <laughs> like I'm not here to lose. So you know, she took it for a while, and then she got so good, I could never beat her again. Right on. I, I'm like I'm not it's gonna a good pretend. Lesson, I'm though. like I'm not gonna pretend you you're gonna win. I'm not gonna pretend you won. I'm here. I'm here to beat your yeah. ass. She yeah. became, she, I never won another checker game. After about a month of that, she got so good. <laughs> I'm like, let's move on to something else. Chess. But, she, but she remembers that, and she thinks that's great because, you know, she's mm. been to friends' houses where, you know, ah, you won. And no one cares. <laughs> Who cares? Like, yeah, you didn't win. Man. You didn't win. You're telling this person a false situation. Now they're going to go through life thinking, I'm supposed to win. I win all the time. <laughs> well, so, you know, I... um. My son Major is uh, 19, so but through the last eight, nine years, I was involved, sometimes managing, sometimes just a dad, but watching and photographing these kids, watching these kids grow up playing baseball for Moon Township. And I was really, it was really an interesting sociological study for me. I saw a lot of good and a little bad. I saw the helicopter parents. I saw the fanatical, you know. You have to play. You have to play the best. You those, have to be the best. Yeah, I, and I saw. I saw. It, but most of most of the parents really had it. To, they they understood. But it was interesting that I remember playing little league here at the Kiwanis in Coriopolis in the seventies, and just like it taking every loss so devastating, going mm -hmm. home and kicking the ground, <laughs> and, you know. And these kids lose, including my own kid who loves the game, but didn't want to lose. And when he lost, and they all took it in stride. They were going to go get some ice cream, and life was okay. Well, be and there I, next there's time. probably something to that, but I could tell there was there, the killer instinct in regards to understanding that, that you know you need to strive to win in life. Sure, if it everybody wasn't there, no. If everybody's a winner, then no one is. I mean. If everybody's a winner, then who's the winner? It's like, you know, they get 
freaking blink your eyes right and you'll get a gold star. I mean, mm-hmm. it's bad. That is not... I have no idea how it's going to end up, but I think there's going to be a generation that's almost not going to be able to take care of themselves. They're just so used to being coddled coddled, and they win every time and they never do anything wrong. And it's like, really? That's not life. What does that, what does that yield, though, for the potential of future entrepreneurs? Because you have to be risk averse. You have to have that, that internal drive, that self-starting. A self-starter has to be in you. Right. And if they're being because I think some of the best entrepreneurs are people that had to overcome some bad shit. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. That's what that's what if you look at entrepreneurism. But to answer your question, I think that what's going to have to happen, what I try to tell everybody is you got to find what you'd like to do. You know, Mm -hmm. go take a million jobs, take a hundred million jobs. You have to land on something that you enjoy. And it may not be a job, but doing all that might lead you to what you like. So I think even though these kids don't have that, if they find something that truly they're passionate about, right. they're probably going to be pretty good at it because they're going to feel that spark. You know, it's going to take something to spark that in them mm-hmm. because they haven't been, uh, they haven't been like led down that path. Okay. So I think that there's hope for some of them because they're going to some of the, you know, some of these guys are going to come up and say, "Oh my God, I really like this beer. I think I'll I'm do be beer." A professional drinker. <laughs> <laughs> Could go that way. I would have hoped he said, maybe I'll brew beer. But you know what? I think I'm just going to drink it. That's way easier. <laughs> you don't have to strive too hard to drink the beer. Try to make that shit, though. Fuck uh, that shit. <laughs> I, I want your story here. I My mean, I, story. I want your story. And it's tough for me to be objective because I love you. you <laughs> and what you did for me, which is you are a huge part of my story, ah. that that like that um, 18 months before you sold to your sister, and, and God bless Lucy and, and, and her husband, Freddie, they were so good to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, they... They were actually leaving a little bit nicer to me <laughs> than he was. Hey, I was trying to help. <laughs> you, you gave my start, yes. Get, you know. Yes. Well, you you subjected me to your brother Mio oh, for like you know. What I mean, that was a whole that different. That I bar. have to apologize about. <laughs> you have no, my... no, no. Lucy retained, <laughs> Freddie retained him. I had to deal with him there too. But um, everything that I learned that I needed to hear at that age, you you were like that voice of reason, and I, I'm still served by it. Customer uh, service, customer loyalty, having thick skin, knowing when to you know to to to, to bow the head and, and just get on with it. Those things, and and you were a marine, if I remember correctly, and you had told me that you know you. You love to party and have a good time and all that. When you when you went into the Marines, I remember you, remember you telling me this as a I was a young person mm-hmm. that it was they kicked your ass yep. and it was time that you know you had to find a different version that. of you. I really needed right? that. right. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have made it through my 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 twenties you know without going to the Marines. I, I was just I just needed to get away. And like you said, coming back after those three years that I was away, it was interesting. You come to this town and you appreciate the town. Mm -hmm. But it was fun. I had a chance to be in Okinawa for almost three years, which was cool. Yeah. I had a captain who was a diver. So we, you know, he, (laughs) I ran into this Puerto Rican chick and, you know, we were hanging out. So he, he liked me and he's like, he he says, Corporal, I need you to see me in my, see see my office tomorrow morning. I'm like, all right, all right, Cap. <laughs> Get in there. He goes, I noticed you're getting real chummy with this girl. She goes, she goes, she says she wanted to marry you. Are you gonna marry her? I'm like, I was thinking about it. He goes, you ain't fucking marrying her. <laughs> so really? Yeah. He, wow. He saved me. Okay. I would probably would have married her at, eight, at 17, 18. Wow. So he threw he threw a a, a, a mask and a snorkel over to me he goes tomorrow we're going diving i'm like i, I, I don't i don't die. he goes no you're going diving it was fantastic i'm glad i did that i mean we were on a base that was surrounded by the ocean right and the the second base i was on i cannot remember the name of it because the first base was a, a marine air wing and that was called uh fatima that was mm-hmm. the marine air wing well back to second year it was an old army base right on the ocean and i can't remember the name of it but it was literally the ocean was like 30 feet from my door so we could just throw on fins, walk backwards about 25 yards, and start snorkeling. It was wow. awesome. Yeah. So it was life-changing for you. Yeah. And, you know, seeing that culture was really cool. You know, that's I think that's where I got, like, my design sense is usually pretty minimalist, you know, uh-huh. and kind of clean lines yeah, and all no that. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And that just stuck with me. You know, I just like their simple lifestyle. And, you know, the Japanese, although I don't think Okinawa is a true rendition of the mainland, but it's close. Mm-hmm. 
I think their culture is so old that they've made the mistakes that we're making now a million times over their five or six or whatever, 7,000 years that they've been or whatever. <laughs> they've been around a long time. And they're very centered now. There's yeah. like, you know, like when the light turns green, they all walk. No one's talking on their phone. Everybody walks across the street at the same time. It's fantastic. Very orderly. Very orderly, but it's a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. And like, if you look at like the Netherlands and all these places, you know, they don't have the diversity that we have. Right. So when they, you know, they, they grow up with a certain culture, you know, and this culture says that you must work hard and you must not take advantage of the government. And that's just ingrained in them. Right. So there's no fighting that. They're all on the same page. Mm-hmm. And I, I think this epidemic proves that because they just kept on going. They're like, listen, right. it's dangerous. Wear a mask. Mm-hmm. But they didn't try to control your every fucking waking moment. Adapt and overcome, right? Yeah. It's like, you guys are smart. We, right now, it looks pretty dangerous. We suggest you do this, this, and this. They didn't shut the whole goddamn thing down. Yeah. They, because, you know what? Honestly- We could learn from that. I think that we, I think that we should know that. I mean, this- mm, again, Really? <laughs> yeah. We, we uh, should. But I mean, here's we the thing don't. that's really aggravating. I hate to keep talking about the virus, hey, but- hey, Sure show, buddy. <laughs> I try to watch all the news. You know, mm-hmm. all of them. Yeah. And you have doctors that are on the conservative stations and doctors that are on the liberal stations. Literally- polar opposites of what they tell you how is that possible these people went to the same fucking schools right they have studied the same shit <laughs> and you're gonna tell me that you guys are exactly opposite yeah it's bullshit it's 100 percent bullshit what <laughs> i'm sorry it's 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 obviously fitting a narrative. But what I'm saying is, how is that possible? And like you said it's earlier, not possible. it's not possible. It's not possible. Like what you said earlier, I mean, bad, you know, bad information just gives you bad decisions. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what they want. They don't want you to make intelligent decisions. They want to be the one to make them for you. So, is Wolf getting bad information, or is Wolf having a slight god complex and? thinking he's king of Pennsylvania and you're going to do what I say. This is my moment in life to shine and fill my ego. I think there's a, I think it's a combination. It both? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think he doesn't want the responsibility of something rehappening. He's you know, hedging his bets then. He's hedging his bets. I think, I mean, I don't know the guy. I would love to talk to him, but I don't, I don't know that he, I think that he thinks that he is going to be the one to save us. Yes. But I also think that he doesn't want to say, let's go, and then all of a sudden a spike, and now all of a sudden you said, let's go. But all 49 other, 46 <laughs> other governors have done that's, that. Well, that's a good point. I mean, like, I don't, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I just, oh my God. So then what could it be? I mean, it's, you know, this is all human nature shit going on. It's like he just, he, he feels that he's going to control it. I think flattening the curve, I think there was probably some real validation of us th- staying away from each other. I and, think that was important. But once that curve was flattened, we should have gone back to work uh-huh. because doctors are saying now that it didn't stop people from getting it. No. If a million people- It may was, have prolonged it. It just prolonged it. I think the idea of flattening the curve was don't rush all these people to the hospital at once. Okay. And we didn't overwhelm our hospitals. Well, not, we barely touched our hospitals. What about that boat that, flo- that, that boat that floated into New York Harbor, and, and I think that they ended up putting some cancer patients on there? I think I think 25 or 30. I mean, But there wasn't any COVID patients on no there. No COVID because they didn't want to mingle all these people. But, you know, I don't know. I think it was a very low number that ended up using it. At the same time, they built that big hospital in the park. Like another giant freaking. And all this stuff needs to come out here at some point. There needs to be, going. but there needs to be full disclosure that we, if 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 it comes out that we panicked too much, and we legislated out of that panic too much, you can't go back and sue individual politicians. No, it was an unknown. But we need to learn for the next time, and hopefully it's not in our our, ta- our time. But if this cannot happen again. I mean, do you tell them, you're going to tell me now that every time we get a virus, we're going to just shut the fucking world down? Is that what you're saying? I don't understand. I mean, you know, the ramifications of it are such that, you know, domestic violence is ticking up. You know, suicides no are ticking up. one talks about that. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is shutting down is, hey, if you're telling us we need to shut down for three weeks to flatten the curve, let's do it. We did it. We did it. But then all of a sudden you move the goddamn coal po- goalpost on us and say, now nah, we can't open until we have well, a vaccine. Well, not all states did that. No. This, this particular state did. And, yep. and I think there needs to be accountability. I think when this is all said and done, if, and it's an if, if it turns out that we flattened the curve and and, and and 
we don't spike again and we kind of get past this maybe herd immunity starts to set in or we it's, get it past will definitely it. set in we get past it i think if the pennsylvania legislature does not haul <laughs> dr levine and the rest of the team and of course the governor and and make them testify in front of the legislator I don't care who controls the House. I don't care about Pennsylvania politics. I just don't. No, I don't. But, think. but I think there should be public hearings so someone can actually question the governor and get detailed answers on why he did what he did. What drove you to these decisions? Not looking to put no. him in jail. No. I just want to understand because, you know, the one thing that hurts more than anything as a Pennsylvanian is, like, as a citizen and as a realtor, specifically as a realtor, we weren't given any information on why things were. It's just because he fucking said so. Yeah, you can't sell a house. I, I mean, don't want to. You can't tell me I can't work because you fucking said so well, without explaining to me why. What was your thought process? How did you end up Help there? Me, I'm, I'm an educated guy. Help me understand. But you know, here, here's the here's what happened. Okay, everybody. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to us. If you History go outside, mankind. you're gonna die. <laughs> Unless, of course, you have to go outside. If you go outside, everyone in your family will die and you will burn in hell. Unless, of course, you have to go outside. So, what the fuck is it? Either it's so bad that none of us should be outside, or it's not. Mm -hmm. I know, man. I like, know. What the fuck is I, going I, and, on? And, 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 and you know what? This is, so this is a little personal side. <laughs> so as soon as the pandemic started, I, you know, there was boredom. I, I read. I, I planned. I, I came down here. I screwed with lights. I did anything <laughs> to keep myself busy. And then I said, you know what? I want to, I'm going to drop 30 pounds during this pandemic, and I'm going to do it by walking and running a little bit, but walking a lot. And I went on the trail for a while, and it got too congested, and I was getting too many dirty looks because I wasn't wearing a mask. <laughs> Social shaming, baby. Social shaming. So then I said, okay, well, if I walk State Avenue from Main Street to George Street. Was that about a mile? And I make three loops. It's like seven miles. Oh, loop. Well, you're done a complete loop. Yeah, yeah if I do that, it's 90 minutes. It, it'll, I can clean my head, and I've done that religiously every day. I don't say that for a medal. I'm saying that what I learned in that to eight weeks of doing that was that I was so paranoid. I'd cross the street when I'd see someone yes. coming, not because I was really afraid. I didn't want to put them. them. I didn't want to put them in them. Robert. Yes. And after a while, like today, I was doing it. I'm walking. I'm like, you know, eh, fuck <laughs> them. I'm like, you know, this is this is insanity. Yeah. You move. <laughs> I did. Of course, I moved. Well, of but, course. But I mean, like, but because you understand. But I didn't wear a mask one time because I know the implications of wearing a mask too long and exercising is not healthy. No, you're, you're breathing back. Oh, carbon dude. dioxide right yes. come on so you're telling people to go out and exercise with masks on how the fuck could a doctor look me in the eye <laughs> and say go out and exercise heavily for 90 minutes with a mask on yeah, that's, make, that's healthy restrict your breathing as much as possible are, are you are you kidding me well come how on. about the beginning they come said on. don't wear masks they're useless so what changed like it, right the big the first thing they said about masks is don't waste your time with masks it's just useless it doesn't help and then keep all, people scared that's exactly mask right. Mask is a scary thing. That's exactly psychologically. right. Psychologically. Exactly right. Right? Absolutely right. Uh, maybe maybe all the politicians should have gotten no pay through this whole thing. Well, they got paid. That's see? my point. My point is that, all right, if you're going to shut down the economy, shut down your pay. That way you experience what everyone else is experiencing. Yeah, and the, the decisions might have been a little different then, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> hey, let's open this shit up. <laughs> so your story. Back to your oh, story. Oh, my story. So where did... The, where did the passion for cooking come? Did you have that when you, as a teenager with your mom, with your dad, who well, were lovely, lovely people, by the way? They lovely were. people. Oh, my God. Well, I think growing up in, in the household, you know, well, when we immigrated, a, a good chunk of the people that lived in our town immigrated here at the same Petendro? time. Petendro? Yes, they were there. No, no, uh, we were. Uh, Where'd you guys come from? Oh, my God. Uh, Piscata. Ah, the okay. of Piscata. So okay. Central Italy, right outside of Rome. Well, you were an outlier then. Yeah. You didn't have a lot of family, right, no. in that region? Well, that town, I mean, every time I talk about it, from the more I learn about it, like it was a small town. I can't tell you how many people lived there, but just a guess, just sparsely uh -huh. houses and a lot of property on each house. May have been seven, eight hundred, nine hundred people. It? Maybe, maybe. I'll have to check that out. Wow, okay. But, um, so... In the 60s, you know, there was nothing happening in Italy. You know, the economy was pretty gone. There was no jobs. 
So there was three places that the people that left our area ended up. Pittsburgh, Australia, or Argentina. So we ended up here. Uh, Your cousin's in Australia. Australia. Yeah, cousins I'd are in Australia. I'd them all. Yeah, I know you are. I know that. <laughs> I saw that. But, and it's just, uh, so they ended up here because of the jobs. But the point about the food now, because they were all here, you know, it wasn't, it was not unusual for a whole family to pick up, walk down the street and go see Uncle Joe. Right. Or go see Mary, because Mary made the best peach cookies and you know you go over to the next house and he makes the best prosciutto and so you just that's bounce awesome them. yeah so you you know so growing <laughs> up around people that were very passionate about a few things a few things like someone wanted the, the, the best gnocchi the but you know what i mean that's just you knew these people for that thing you know okay and so i think that's just what got me going in food and then at 14 uh one of our friends my oldest sister lucy's friend was the head chef at the hilton in downtown pittsburgh okay and he calls me up one day he goes hey i need some help can you come after school i'm like yeah and that was it <laughs> so i went there and helped at the at the uh hotel and next thing you know i'm you know 14 15 taking a bus downtown every night 21a 21a <laughs> drop you off right in front of the hotel there and you know it just happened like all of a sudden i'm working all the time <laughs> mm-hmm. you know i really lost a lot I just worked, you know. I, I mean, I didn't get it. My, my weekends, I, I was at the hotel. Yeah. You know, I, didn't, I worked all the time. So after the Marines, you came home, and you did not want a 9-to-5 job. What, where did, that, where did that, that spark of entrepreneurship come from? You know, I don't you – know, I, once I, when I first got out – I'm trying to know, before I went in, actually, we had a cousin – <laughs> this is a funny story because he had a bunch of pizza shops. So I go to the back one day, and they were called uh, – what were they called? Oh, my God, what were they called? Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, so I go into his office. He's got a giant shopping bag full of cash. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's awesome. He goes, The Italians in this town were known for doing <laughs> well, that. Well, this was in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so, I knew that for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> probably but, better you don't <laughs> but the story went like this so i'm like wow that's great he goes yeah pizza shop's good you know you make money so maybe that was the spark i found out later after i got married that we're watching the news one day and his helicopter is buzzing this house so i'm like that's 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 his house it turns out he was a cocaine dealer. Okay. okay. <laughs> so that money was not from the yeah, pieces shop. That, that can also increase the money in your bag, for <laughs> yeah. sure. And so it was so funny. I'm like, that fucker, I thought the whole time it was all that money from the pizza shop. Right. But I think that got me thinking about being in business and, and all of that. So that was kind of fun. But I've been mostly in, I mean, I've done, we've done a lot of stuff. I've done some retail. Yeah. So we had, I'm trying to think, the first business was Sabatino's. Yeah. And, and then the clothing, right? Yeah, we, my wife and I opened uh, Munchkin Land, uh-huh. <laughs> and uh-huh. that was actually quite successful. I remember that? That was pretty successful. And at that time, my family, Mio, they opened across the Debo's, street. Debos, Debos, and the old Lenther Mill and Street Mall. Mall. This was here. Uh, no, that's down the block. No, no, that's right. This is the this, well, this my, was way, my Mall, way Mall. My way right. Mall. Yeah. And then after that, what was my next business? So uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, I remember doing, after we got married, uh, Valenti down the street, he uh, he had a parking lot there. And I was like, you know, I just, after I sold the pizza shop, I'm like, I got to do something. Right. So I went there and started barbecuing ribs and chicken. I remember that. So the first couple of days, I think I was there three or four days, a trucker pulls up. Hey, how, you know, how many ribs you got? I'm like, I, he goes, well, he goes, what if I pay you for 25 slabs and another trucker pulled up here and pick it up later this afternoon? I'm like, yeah, right. He goes, how much is that? And I, I told him, I can't remember what it was. Here, take some money for yourself. They did that like, wow, three times a week. How about that? And they would. Uh, I think they ended up on Neville Island, where they all parked over yeah. there and they ate the ribs. Yeah. So that was kind of cool. This is mid eighties, right? Mid eighties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, God, what else have I done? Jesus, I forget. <laughs> Tried selling cars for a minute. Like you know, I'd get I'd get a young kid come in, he'd see something really sexy, and I'm like, well, how much do you make? He, you know, blah blah blah. I make a thousand a month. Okay, thousand a month. Your payment's gonna be five hundred. Uh-huh. Do you like getting laid? Eighty. Because <laughs> you're gonna have that car, and guess what? You ain't gonna do shit. You're going to Burger King, <laughs> and, and they didn't like that. I was talking people out of. I was talking people out of spending their money on these extravagant cars. It was so funny. Actually, I did okay, but I mean, every time I saw someone was like stretching, I'm like, well, yeah. that, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a car, you were too honest to be a car it's salesman. Like a car? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, you're gonna spend all your money on a car. You're looking 
look at you. You're in your prime. You should be out having fun. Don't worry uh-huh. about paying for a goddamn car. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my story there. <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> then the um, I don't know fast forwarding quite a few. That's quite right. A few. When did the uh, Bellevue restaurant open? That was in 2000. Okay. So 2000, uh, the restaurant scene was just in its infancy at the time. Um, trying to think of who opened in 2000. Like uh, Bonaterra was out in Sharpsburg. Right. He actually was nominated for James Beard. Mm-hmm. So he did good. I'm not sure if he opened exactly in 2000, but it was around there. Dish on Southside open. Fantastic restaurant. Right. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else was open at the time that was significant. Uh, Tony Paez had uh, Bon Vivant. Mm-hmm. Michael Oricchio had La Forêt. Right. Uh, La Pommier in Southside. But there was literally a handful of like high end restaurants. And so when we opened, Tony, who was absolutely known by the whole city, he was just fantastic at Bon Vivant. Everybody knew him. He I forget how we, we met and he said, Let's do a dinner at your place. Same with Michael Oricchio. These guys were not intimidated. They were like, Hey, let's you know, right. we've heard some nice things. You're doing a good job. Let's do a dinner together. And that was that is so cool. It was so cool. Yeah, that's so different. Yeah, so cool. And so that was just nice to, and all of a sudden, you kind of just, because of that, I just felt like I was part of the community. Right. And, you know, uh, just tried to meet everybody that was doing cool stuff and, you know, mm-hmm. tried to be involved with them at whatever I could. And it was just fun, you know. This Where, is, where'd the vision for Vivo come from? Like, you, you guys, because to me, I was really surprised because Bellevue was... What appeared to it be was very the stupidest su- thing we ever did. Well, Bellevue, <laughs> Bellevue appeared to be very successful. I could never get a table in the damn place. <laughs> well, you know, that, I guess because at the time there wasn't much happening. So if people had money then and they were out and they were looking for restaurants. I mean, right. they literally, you know, you didn't have to advertise really because right. they found you. If, you right. if they heard about it, hey, there's a neat little high-end restaurant just opened over here or over there. And what I found is folks want to be the ones to tell their friends, hey, man, I want to take you to this place. Right. I want to take you to this place. Right. I found it. I found it. I want to take you. <laughs> it's bragging yeah, rights. Yeah, take you. And <laughs> so that was just interesting, you know. But as time went on, you know, Bellevue – just didn't make sense for us anymore uh you know you had restaurants everywhere yeah about maybe 2008 9 yeah stuff was happening you know there was Mm -hmm. lots of great restaurants opening up everywhere but you were getting a lot of like you swiftly folks coming down already yeah Mm -hmm. people all over the city we got so much press eric it was it was i remember and it was because there wasn't much happening you know so if you were talking about the food scene you know you talked about a few restaurants you know yeah 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 yeah. and so there was just a lot of press and and they i mean bellevue hated us and then when i got my buddy roberta oh because here's what they said so when we were open you'd have mercedes range rovers parked in front and the local the local like that is not what we do Okay, oh. that is not who we are. We uh, do not. And like, you want a bunch of hoopties parked out there? Like, what? Do you, what is it that you're looking for, man? I don't understand. You know, these people were coming to town. They were spending money at Vivo. Yeah. Maybe going up to the uh, the yeah. drugstore. There wasn't much, but yeah. you know, while they were in town, hey, we're gonna Vivo. I'm gonna hit that drugstore real quick. I'll get gas real quick. Right. You know, right. so right. it wasn't just Vivo. They right. spent money throughout the whole place. And then Roberto opened. <laughs> All of a sudden, they hated us because now. Look, the streets were aligned with all these high end cars. Right. That is not representative of Bellevue. <laughs> we are not trying to do that here. You got to stop immediately. And it was a week. Oh, that's so archaic, it's right? So that's so archaic. It's funny. terrible. So funny. Like, I was trying to just put tables in front of my restaurant. It right. took I three that. years to make the decision. Wow. Oh, my God. I, I remember one of the local councilmen come in. And, he wrote this article about, oh, if this happens, it's going to open a can of worms. So he walks into my restaurant, into the kitchen. I went across the across the fucking counter. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, you're fucking kidding me? A can of worms for fucking tables and chairs on yeah. the goddamn... What are you talking about? Yeah. We're not doing human sacrifice, you dumb motherfucker. <laughs> I was so mad. We ended up being friends. He goes, Sam, you were, you were right. I'm like, you guys were ridiculous. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you would think that, you know, a community leader, you know, would encourage all ups, upscale, outstandingly well-run Well, let's just say successful businesses, businesses whether they were upscale or not. Those successful businesses. Well, you were definitely upscale. <laughs> yeah, we, were, we, were the, yeah. we were one of the most expensive restaurants well, in the city at the I, time. I could never get to, well, I, you got, you made sure I got a table, but I never, didn't want to pull, I never, ever, I, I don't I never, do that. I never do that. I never yeah, do that. I never pulled any car, any, any ace cards out of there. I remember glove. you, I remember you bringing them girls, boy. <laughs> 
Like Eric got like a stable or something. No, I don't know. that was my that was my pre-marriage years, my my single years. Yes, but it was. But it he, was a, he did real good. But it was a, it was a good dating spot because the ambiance was great. The conversations were always good because you could hear. Yep. I mean, it, it, it even when it was busy, you the, there was something about the acoustics of that place where you could have a conversation. Yeah, at it was the table. It was, yeah, that place was unique. It I was mean, unique. We built that with sticks and stones, literally. Oh, I mean, shit. we went to Construction Junction. Mio helped me quite a bit with that. But we went to Construction Junction, and the way we did it is just picked up cool shit. We're like, all right, we're going to use this somewhere. Got it. You know, we have a bunch of this. What are we going to do with that? Well, how about that wall? Okay, let's put it over there. You know, so it was kind of an art piece. <laughs> you know. It was kind of fun. Oh, yeah. It was very cool. And, and the ambiance was great. Oh, the chairs. Those chairs, man. They were... People would be there all night, and at the end of the night, they'd be like this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, call me a cab. I'm like, in fucking Bellevue? Are you kidding me? <laughs> You're better off trying to get a plane. <laughs> oh, I can, I can remember going there on a few occasions, and by the time I was done eating <laughs> the, the courses, and then I had had my alcohol, and then... I, and then Lori insisted that I, I try the dessert. You don't have to eat the whole thing. Just take it <laughs> Just, home. Of course, I ate the whole thing. Yeah. I was done. done. I, I had I had to call. I done. think it was, that was Uber was just around starting around that time. Done. I had to call a ta- Uber a taxi and either to get my guest home or she maybe, you know, if she maybe didn't go well and she had met me there and she drove on her uh, <laughs> home on her own. But, um, yeah, that, and it was funny because I came to look for you about a year later after Vivo started and I couldn't find it. You mean the one in, in uh, uh, Swickley? When Vivo first opened, you had no sign. Oh, no, no, no sign. And, you know, all there the... Was, co- there was no snow. You no. Know, <laughs> what I'm telling you, Vivo and Swickley for a period of time had no sign. You had an address and there was a, a really kind of a cool gated area and, a, and there was like vines on the gate. There was like foliage on the gate. But you weren't sure. <laughs> you know, that's kind of cool, but honestly, it's it's not good for now because everything's Instagram, 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 you know? Right, right, right. So that's probably when have been one of my biggest uh, hurdles. Now Martina, my youngest, is with us, and she's way better at marketing myself. I marketed other restaurants way better than I market my own. You know, I'd tell everybody all Why about Why is that? I have no idea. Like, you know, I'd be talking to someone, if they wouldn't know me, I'd be like, oh, man, did you ever go to this place? you got to go to this place. And then all of a sudden they were found out, you know, once they come like, hey. <laughs> so I thought that was even cooler, yeah. you know, rather yeah. than, oh, come to my restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I no, don't no. know. It's more subtle. I don't know. It's just like, I always, I always love the idea of telling people about restaurants that I liked, you know. The, you learned to be a chef. So you must have learned like just on the job, right? Oh, yeah. I never. No formal training. No. I mean, although the Hilton, I mean, I was around some, some of pretty serious guys there. But I don't know. It's food, man. You know that's why I looked at it. Like what experimentation. Can, that's it. You know you don't like. You know here's here's a, here. I want to make this, but I don't like that ingredient. Leave it out. Now you can't do that with baking. Excuse me. Right. right. <laughs> you can't do that with baking. But you know with with food, people say, "Well, I'm afraid to try." I'm like, "Well, what's going to happen? You screw it up. Like, you have any idea how many dishes a chef will screw up before he gets it right? I or bet. I mean, that's just part of it. You know, you you'll do it, and it'll be pretty good. But you'll say, you know what, I overcooked it, or maybe I should have left this out. And you might do three or four of those things. Right. I'm not saying that any of them were better than the other, but for whatever reason, you do it one way, and it hits you. Like, okay, I think that's it. It's just a psychological thing, maybe. What do you love the most about being a chef? Is it the creation? I mean, you you obviously the the, the cliche would probably be to see how people love your food because that's got to be the gratification of it i mean it's, it but helps the, but the process of it though, do you like do you like um the actual uh, art of cooking or do you like the creation part of it hmm i think when i started the first place i liked all of it more now as i'm older i, I enjoy coming up with some ideas maybe doing a you know a dish and talking to the rest of the guys and say hey you know what do you think of this you know mm-hmm. give them an opportunity to give their advice and Usually it ends up better. Huh. Interesting. So I think that you have to unleash your people. You know, because cooking is a creative endeavor. If you have a bunch of people that are creative sitting back there, but they don't get a chance to do that, it makes it a little boring. So I try to include them. Not everybody wants to be included. There's there's some people that say, you know what? You just tell me how to do it, and I'm good. Yeah. And then other people, I'll say, hey, man, you know, I need, I'm looking to do this. What do you think? And they'll take it by the horns and say, hey, I got this, I got that. And we'll go back and forth a little bit and try to nail the dish, you know. Did you learn that? Was Were you more, for lack of a better phrase, more selfish in your creations in the beginning? And you learned that 
by bringing other ideas and it served you well? I think that's a growing experience for sure. But at the beginning, it was only me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I had to rely on myself, which I think hurt me in the long run. Because now that I'm around a lot of these guys, you know, a lot of these guys went to the French Laundry and stuff. Right. And they've been around some restaurants where they were, in, you know, internationally successful. So they got to see how that chef, you know, got it there somehow. I never really had that. Okay. So this is my rendition of what a restaurant should be, where they had some guidance, or at least they were able to see like a top-notch restaurant. You know, what did it take to get there? You know, what what was the motivation? You know, what what was it that made that place right. so good? But they right. were around it, and they got to see it, and they got to work in it. I never had that, so I'm not saying that hurt me, but maybe it did because I think that uh, I was a little more nonchalant about that. Now I'm okay with it. You know, it's like, that's it. You know, we did it. Great. I'm happy. Is Pittsburgh cuisine not fully appreciated still? No, Pittsburgh is great, man. I mean, Pittsburgh got so much press over the last few years for their food. Rightfully, no doubt. Rightfully so. I mean, right. there's, there's some insane chefs in this town. I mean, literally mm -hmm. great chefs. And it's just cool to see how, how well it's been received by the, you know, by the rest of the country, the when rest you, of the world. When you do these projects, these collaborative projects, there's usually a cause involved too, right? Some of I mean, like... sometimes, you know, honestly, the first one is like when I first met Justin from Cure. Siravina? Yeah. Yeah. We just got along, you know. He goes, we should do something together. I'm like, I've never really did that, you know, at that time. And okay. I'm like, you know, whatever. So he calls up, he goes, we're going to do an Italian barbecue. And he goes, you in? I'm like, I'm in. So he called a bunch of other friends up. So I think the first one was me, Justin. Uh, Dominic from Piccolo Forno, Stephen from Stagione, right. and McKaylee from Dish. And we got so fucked up at the first <laughs> one. It was, it was bad. So was it a, wait, was it an excuse to drink? <laughs> well, we just like each other. You know, we just enjoy each other. We, we, it was, had nothing to do with money uh, or any of that. Uh -huh, like uh -huh. anytime we had a chance to get together and be idiots, we took it. Right you know? on, right on. And, you know, being around these guys, they're they're – so good at what sure, they do. Sure. And their ability to put these big projects together it amazes me. Wow. I am not I'm not that good. Every time they every time they invite me to do it I'm like I'm glad you guys are doing it cuz this <laughs> I, I'm not good at this. You're way better at this than me. And they do. They pull it off, man. They they just are logistic magicians, you know. And it's awesome. Really? Yeah. So so I mean, do you learn from them? Do you pick oh, things up? I do. I mean, just their enthusiasm and you know they're just it's just fun to be around people that are that kind of get along you know mm -hmm. a lot of drugs a lot of alcohol it just adds up to a fun <laughs> night <laughs> 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 just you know we just have a good time what is it about food that just makes you so passionate because cause i look we goof around a lot when i see it we always talk about everything but food but the passion you have for what you do your craft is so overwhelmingly there anyone can feel it why are you passionate about food i think you're right about you know i think any chef wants to go out to the table and say hey how you know how'd you have a good time yeah i had this thing and i liked it because it had this i mean when somebody starts to lay out you know what your food is and it kind of matches what you were trying to do that's pretty impressive but at the first restaurant when the food channel first came out i'll never forget this i had i forget the mushrooms now maybe i'll remember i think i had black trumpets Morels, porcini, and something else. But anyway, this kid, maybe ten years old, comes and you know he was just uh, he was just watching the Food Channel all the time. So his mother says uh, he's such a mushroom guy. I'm like, really? I said, do you want to see some mushrooms? He goes, yeah. What kind you got? I'm like, so I brought him out. He goes, that's a morel. I'm like, what? And he was just. He just watched the Food Channel constantly. How about that? Ten, eleven years old. This kid knew all of the mushrooms. Wow pretty impressive yeah sure so i mean impressive. things like that you know it's kind of interesting to go out and just have people experience a night that they remember and then you know over the years you know we started off with with these folks all of a sudden we start to see their kids coming with them right now we're seeing their kids coming with them uh-huh so that's 20 years have gone yeah. by you know so it's they amazing. came that's a long time so they started coming to us when they were 10 or 11 now right. they're in their 30s right and we've watched this whole thing you know mm -hmm. the whole time it's kind of weird. So the restaurant becomes like restaurants like Dish and places like that, you know, and even Vivo. It just becomes part of the community. That's where right. people go. It's right. not just to eat. Right. It's not 
it's the experience of going there. They like the waiters and they like the ambiance, or you mm-hmm. know, or they don't. I mean, you have to be able to accept that too. You've always had great bartenders. Right now, uh, Josh is awesome. He does. Yeah, a great he is job. awesome. He is awesome. But I think it's the whole experience. We talk about it a lot. Like, you know, what what do you think's going on here? Like, well, you know, no, the whole staff will say it. They're like, well, they people come in, they know us, we know them. You're talking about their family, you know. You know, it's not that we want to be that place where you know you bring their drink over to them before yeah. they ask because yeah, that's yeah, 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 that's yeah, a yeah. tough that's a tough one yeah. to do. You're not cheers. No, uh-uh. because what starts to happen is you know so somebody's off that night. Well, just tell Josh he knows what I want. Well, yeah, but Josh isn't here, and I don't right. know you. Right. right. So it's right, it's a, right. it's kind of tough. It's a balance. It's a balance, but I think it's like anything. I mean, when you go somewhere, no matter what it is, whether you're going to go throw access whatever and you go to the place that somehow just fits and you remember it it's uh-huh. just the experience that you had right it wasn't so much the access but it was like wow we were there i met mm-hmm. this person and we it's just an experience so that's what we try to provide talk about the swickley community and how they've embraced you and, and some of the the folks and just just the we, the reason i asked that question is you and i both know the swickley community you much better than i but the Swickley community is so mis- misunderstood Agreed. outside of Swickley. Agreed. Would you agree? Yeah. I think I think back in the day was probably rightfully so. But what you're seeing now is you I mean these people are very accomplished, you know. Like at the bar, you sit at the bar on any given night, the person next to you is accomplished. Maybe they're a CEO or maybe they're it's like they're they're just they're, they do things. They they they're knowledgeable. They 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 travel. And so I always found it interesting to walk up to a table, you know, to someone you know and say, "Hey Sam, we just got back from Puerto Rico and, you know, we had this steak and it, it was like this and it was like that." I'm like, "Oh man, that sounds fantastic." So you get to know that kind of stuff. And right. I want to know. Like when I ask somebody if they, you know, how their night is going, I don't want you to lie to me. Right. You know. Right. But, you know, tell me what's going on. Was everything yeah. okay? Did you like what we did? How about, hey, you know, we did that tonight. What would you think of it? And I think that's important. I think you have to have that. Well, I think it's just amazing to me, and I'm sure most great chefs do this, but you really do it all the time. And you go out and you greet. I really do. <laughs> you, you love the interaction. I do. And That's your personality. Yeah. Plus, I, like I said, I just want to know who's there. Like, where, where have you eaten? Like, what, what's going on? Like, what's your restaurants that you like? You know, that kind of stuff. Because your clientele travels a lot. A lot. Mm-hmm. And so when you say, you know, cafe – you know, their kids, they've been to real cafes in Paris. So when you open something and call it a cafe, and it's not a cafe, <laughs> right? they know that. Right. And so a lot of times people will uh, the people will try something in Swickley that doesn't work, and they say, oh, they don't know. I'm like, no, they know. <laughs> you know, it's not, they're educated people. Right. You know, it's not like you're, you're not going to fool them. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You can't overcharge for anything. Mm-mm. And that's okay. I mean, we want to give you a value. You know, I don't want to hit you in the head. I want you and to come you back. Don't. And you don't. I want you to come back. Mm-hmm. And that's what we—that's what we build our. That's what we try to build. Is like you know, this is the you. chicken meatballs. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, those. I've are liked fun. a lot of things that you're, but that's the one staple of your menu. We, it's something that's been on. And sometimes for a while. you run out, and yeah. I get really pissed. <laughs> Where's your damn balls? Where's my balls? <laughs> those things are amazing. Oh my God. But it's kind of fun. I mean, you know, it's the it, the town is incredibly supportive. Yeah. You know, as long as you treat them with respect, I got to tell you, when this when this uh, COVID thing started. We had people calling us up and asking us what they could do for us. You know, wow. you need money. What we do for you? It was, it was kind of touching. To be honest, yeah, with no you. doubt. And it wasn't because they were expecting anything back. Right. They just, what can we do to help you? Yeah. And it was wonderful. And the atmosphere there is cozy. I love your out- outdoor. Uh, I had one opportunity to dine outdoor. I loved it. It's hard to get those seats, um, but. It's just really cozy. And yeah. Sometimes I'll sit at the bar, which is a cool bar because it's not like a bar. Right. It's, I can't, how would you explain your bar? <laughs> well, you know, honestly, <laughs> we were very naive to the idea of a bar when we first opened. So what I kept saying is we're a restaurant with a bar. Right. We're not a bar that Amen. has food. Amen. And that's how I justified it. You know, it's yeah. like, it's just a small bar. You know, we could use a bigger bar sometimes. But I bet. Then we're a bar. I don't want to be a bar. Yeah, it you takes know. away from the ambiance of the eating experience, too. I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's just That's just my thought process on it. It's just I just wanted a nice small bar. But, man, some of the conversations you hear, I mean, it's so interesting. You know, mm-hmm. it, we get people from out of town that will show up. And I think this happens to a lot of restaurants. But we have a 
following from people that come from New York to do business. And they say, we always make sure we come here at least once before, you know, before we leave. And you're sitting at the bar and these guys pull up and they're, you know, they're working on this film and, you know, they're working on these sets, but they're just regular people. Yeah. You know, but they're accomplished. Yeah. You know, and how and I, rewarding is that for you? So cool. You know, yeah. for me, I, I love the idea of talking to someone who's done something and right. you know, maybe changed the game and something mm-hmm. or, you know, started something. Mm-hmm. To me, that's cool. You know, I, I guess money does not, I'm not impressed by money. I'm more impressed by the story of it. Right. You know, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. Because sometimes the endeavor. People, yeah. Like, you know, so what did you do? Well, man, I invented this thing. Like, fuck, you invented that? That's awesome. <laughs> you know, Instead of like, I'm a millionaire. Yeah, because there's a lot of those floating around there. Well, that was, they'll, they'll tell you too. It's not so much. Well, you know, we did have a couple. Once of in a while, we, yeah. we only had a couple, and it's, it's it's interesting because like one guy says, "You know, a millionaire." I'm like, everybody here is a fucking millionaire, man. <laughs> <laughs> like That's you only have great. one million. You have one million. You're though? a piker. <laughs> <laughs> But it's just it's just a great town, man. I love that town. All right. So when you're not uh, back in that kitchen, what do you enjoy for free time? Do you, know, you have any free time? You know, I do, actually. I could have more. My staff is always telling me I'm there more than I need to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I've latched on to uh, kayaking now. And, you know, I used to cycle a lot. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I got into kayaking. How? Who introduced you to that? Um, so a good friend who's actually... An architect who's helping me with a project we're working on in Swickley right now. We're doing a six-unit townhouse together. Oh, God bless you. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Yeah. So that was we, we've known each other for. I think he was one of the. He came to the old restaurant either first, second, or third day we opened. Like the first week we opened, their family came and we just got along. We just know each other since then. But um, one day he goes, "Hey, did you ever kayak before?" I'm like, "No." <laughs> so he goes, "Come on, I got a friend who has a couple kayaks." So I got on there. I'm out in the middle of there. I'm like. This is fantastic. Nobody can get to you. <laughs> and right. so I bought an okay a kayak. Solitude there. Yeah. So I bought an okay kayak to start with. Then I realized I liked it. So I went out and bought a really great kayak. Of course you did. I had to. But I use, <laughs> I mean, it's my fifth, sixth year on the water now. No shit. Yeah. So I try to go out. I mean, I'll go out as into the high 40s, you know, with the right gear on. As long as you're, as long as, as, long as it's sunny. You, how far do you go? The farthest I've ever paddled was 12 miles. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Arms must have been killing you. You know, it, it's interesting. It's a lot of technique. Okay. You know, because if you're a lot of people just pull, and that's really not you're, really your torso is supposed to do the work. So you could li- you're literally supposed to have your hands straight out in front of you and twist. All right. So it takes a while to get that motion. You know, so I really practiced it a lot because I wanted to be good at it. And so when you do it right. You're not, it, you know, you can go a pretty good distance because if you start pulling, next thing you know, your shoulders are hurting, your back's right. holding. Because if you're yanking on it all the time. But this way, your arms are just rigid, and you're just, you know, you're just twisting. You're dodging all the tree branches and beer, <laughs> beer cans or what? Beer cans. You know, I, go to, I do the Ohio quite a bit. I like the Ohio. You know. The river's pretty clean right well, now, Well, right? not always, you know. After it, heavy rain. After probably. heavy rain. And there's sometimes you'll go down, and I don't do it anymore. I swear, I think I got sick once. But... It was a heavy rain. It was all bad. I'm like, you know what? I'm going in. And I was just, a, there was like a scum on my boat. And I was like, ah, you know, I you just went, a lesson. yeah. I'm like, <laughs> if it smells now, I don't go if in. If it smells. But sometimes you go down there and it's like a lake, you know, uh-huh. when the when the locks close and it hasn't rained in a while. Yeah. It's fin. Sometimes it's just calm and just yeah. classy. Yeah. Really good. So, so I want to ask you, too, about uh, your love of music. And you turned me on to, at that era, was like Rick James, Prince. Funk. But most importantly, you turned me on, which I think was life-changing for me because I just love this band, and it's Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, you turned me on to them while we were working there, which was for a little heavy metalist guy, I mean, for a little heavy metalist kid. That was a big change. I remember you just dancing over there making those pizzas, you know. <laughs> well, you probably liked them because you, you saw you saw they were talented. Oh, you know, to me, yeah. like I'm not genre specific. I can like anything if there's talent behind it. Uh huh. And so I think some of the new music with all that auto tune and all that, there's no talent behind it. No. And there's no passion behind it. Right. And it's amazing how many kids in their late 20s, early 30s are still listening to. 
you know, Zeppelin yeah. and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. it's just, it was because it was good music. But Earth, Wind, and Fire was an eye opener for me because that was a whole band with, you know, with guitars oh, yeah. and brass and, and, and Philip Bailey, amazing singer, right? And even a chorus every and now and then. A chorus, now. right. And so that was a whole. And you know we were coming out of the disco area, and you were you loved the dance. I remember that you were you love you I did loved love the dance. To dance. I didn't you know disco now. I can't even listen to it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. Sometimes I'm like you can't well, listen we coming, to well, disco. We were coming out of disco, right? It was eighty one, yes, eighty two. Luckily, Oof. but um, yeah, you really helped me open my mind to music, which served me well because what you probably don't know is many years later. Uh, I get into jazz Ooh. and 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 old all of it. The Benny Goodman. I got into jazz fusion with Aldi Miola, Stanley Clark, oh, and Return yeah. to Forever. Stanley Clark, Return uh... to Forever. All I, I just really immersed myself in all that stuff, and I really feel to this day my what I believe to be is a very well rounded palette of music came from you opening my mind to get away from that you know that bashing heavy metal all the time, all the time. as a no. young kid, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Honestly, I read something not too long ago. It seems like people that like heavy metal also like classical because mm-hmm. it's kind of it's orchestrated to a certain degree. A lot, of, a lot of skill in those guitar players and drummers. Jesus, uh-huh. they're ridiculous. But my point is, that's kind of interesting that that kind of goes together. You would, I, I would have never in a million years thought that that was so. I think some of the really, I mean, I'm looking on the wall over there of the guitar years, and some of those guys were able to take classical riffs and play it on heavy metal guitar which is just with all the modes and scales yeah. and it's amazing now my my opinion is and i don't know if i'm right i think that there isn't a scale or note that you could come up with that hasn't already been done in correct. classical music correct now unless you can generate it electronically that's not possible humanly yeah but I don't think there's much. Like, I don't like all classical, but boy, some of that stuff, you'd just be like, mm. Mm. you know, it's mm. weird when you're bobbing your head to classical well, there's music. There are certain pieces. There are certain <laughs> and you pieces. And you end up like, yeah, that's awesome. There's, yeah, Mozart's, I think for me, it's Mozart's seventh, I think. It's just, there's something about that piece that just strikes me. Um, I, I think Liszt is kind of a, a renegade, and his stuff is bizarre. Uh-huh. So no I, question. I, I, I love it. No question. I, love I, w- it. I would agree. The plan agree. was it the planets? List yeah. the planets. Yeah. That is beautiful music. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I don't know. There's just something. And my friend, my staff always makes fun of me because I find myself in my in my car. I usually listen to classicals. I don't want any commercials. Very collect- eclectic. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want commercials. I don't want to hear commercials. Have you changed your palate over the years? Has age done that to you? You know, I think right now, uh, what I really enjoy is like a jazz funk fusion. Interesting. You know, a little bit more, you know, high energy and uh, jazz funk fusion. Just like, uh, it just. What would just, you classify? Like the, the, remember the Brothers Johnson? The Brothers Johnson were fantastic. <laughs> I mean. There's a lot going on there's there. There's a lot going on there. They did some really great music. Uh-huh. You know, my problem, <laughs> my problem is I know what I like, but I have a hard time putting my finger on it. I know when I hear it. Right. And, and so when I do a playlist, like, I, I'm like, I just want this kind of music. <laughs> I get it. How do I get this kind of music? I get and it. And it's hard for me. Well, and like I said, you broadening my palate at a younger age led me to led me to immerse more in music, which led to guitars and all that. Al Di Miola became like a huge hero of mine. Like uh-huh. I could absorb all of his work as different as all those eras are, acoustic, electric, fusion. Um, I just love it. And I remember, I remember like um, – Going there two years ago, I went to the Palace Theater with my wife, and I watched the show. And I looked at my wife, and I said, if Sam Batista had not opened my eyes to music outside of what I was just immersed with as a kid, I don't think I ever would have even known this guy existed. Wow. And here I am, you know, watching Soundcheck and little meet and greet. It was a thrill for me. Yeah. I mean, he's like, you know, a he's huge so badass, influence. Oh, so. my God. If you like that, I mean, it's not for everybody. Not for everybody. Not for everybody. No. You know, no. honestly. And that's what I say about it. But that, like uh, Victor Wooten. Oh, my God. <laughs> what one, a, of the, one of the greatest basses. I just, it's just ridiculous listening to him. And then when he plays with uh, the banjo, uh, Wooten. Um, uh, uh, Bella Fleck. Bella Fleck and Wooten together. Bella are Fleck and the Fleck tones. Ridiculous. There's I, some, again, Understanding that being introduced to that in the early '90s, uh, they had a song called "Sinister Minister." Yeah. Why I remember that, I have no idea. 
But Victor Wooten, total badass. Him, Stanley Clark, Jocko Bistori's oh, before yeah, him. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's where I just really had an appreciation for the fretted instrument that really led to better things in my life. But, you know, when you're young, really young and impressionable, you need to have people come into your life and show you different things. Not that what you're I doing didn't is have wrong. That until you came into my life. And really, oh, and it was that. Earth, Wind, and Fire. That was that one band. Like, you remember you saying, well, you know, they have guitars, they have brass, they, they have everything. <laughs> yeah, they just did it, in and in a, a, they were unbelievably talented people, man. And you turned me on to Chicago, which was not on my radar as a rock and roller. Right. But man, that, that stuff really was changed it's me. It's really, Chicago's awesome. Man. Changed me. A lot of that stuff. Well, you know, I grew up in high school with uh, Kevin Latchaw, and so I had a chance to you know travel around with those guys for a while. Right. And... Uh, you know they played all that stuff. Right. They did Chicago really well. Uh-huh. Kevin's voice is fabulous. Uh huh. He just had that voice, man. Yeah. And then Grand Funk Railroad. Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, for a trio, <laughs> those people are ridiculous. Uh huh. And I see, I ignored all that, and that was really that was heavy stuff. Yeah. Which I loved once it w- I was introduced to it. Mm-hmm. You were kind of like that older brother for me that in a time where I needed that mm-hmm. because there was a. Again, it comes back to life lessons, you know, and I and I you're part of my story. A little sappy to say that, but I I truly mean that. Like I don't know if I would have had the opportunities I've had based upon my mindset had you not like shaken me a little bit and say, "Listen, there's more to life than this little, little narrow pathway you're on." Yeah, not that you're wrong. There's no right or wrong. No, but you need to know more. So talk to me about your love of audio equipment, because I've seen some extremely ultra-modern-looking turntables that you were building yeah. from scratch. Well, we ended up in Bellevue. We ended up... This story is awesome. We had a coffee shop called Affogato at the time. Did you ever go to that coffee shop? I did not. It was, I don't know if I even was aware of that. Uh, it was beautiful. Okay. And um, so we're in the coffee shop one day, and there's a uh, the old Murphy's building up the street. Oh, is that where it was? Well, we were talking, no, I was talking about the old Murphy's building because there was another dollar store trying to come in. Okay. And so I'm bitching to somebody in there like, I can't believe it. another fucking dollar store. <laughs> and this professor from uh, from Pitt, I don't know if I should mention his name, but anyway, he uh, he comes over, he goes, Sam, what, what's going on? I'm like, they're going to move out that, you know, there's another dollar store coming in town. There was two of them. He goes, well, what do you want to do? I'm like, I don't want them here. <laughs> so he goes, do you want to buy the building? I'm like, I, yeah. <laughs> Strokes me really? a check. Stroke me a check for a hundred grand. Said, let's go get it. Wow. And so when we did that, we ended up with a uh, on the first floor. We ended up with a vintage store, like seven thousand square feet. I did not know that. Oh, it was fantastic. If you look up five seventeen five twenty one online okay. in Bellevue, there's some pictures. But anyway, so we had this giant space. There was furniture, and we, we, it, was, it was like a giant, you know, just vintage store. So I started looking around, and I started buying up all these amps that I could get my hands on and turntables, and we were selling them. And so they needed fixed. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to learn how to fix turntables. So I started to learn how I got real good at it. I'm like, all right, give me a turntable. I can take care of it because I wanted to sell them. And one day I said, well, shit, there's nothing to this. I think I'm just going to build one. So I built a bunch of turntables before I went to the machine shop Uh and I was just using bits and pieces and they turned out pretty nice I have a couple that I kept because Uh they actually work really well and so I get to the machine shop one day and I'm like hey guys I want to build a turntable like what do you mean turntable (laughs) and they're looking like I'm crazy like you mean like a turntable for albums he goes no we don't want to do that I'm like all right let me let me I know I, I get it but let me try this so I need to spin a very heavy platter very efficiently, smoothly, and quietly. They go, we can do that. I'm like, let's build a turntable. They went from not wanting the project to immersing themselves in it. We built everything, like, all the way down to the lifter. I remember. So the Behind the restaurant in Bellevue had a workshop or something, right? Well, but that went to their machine shop to build Uh, this. Ah, okay. So we get to the lifter, and we're playing with it. We're playing. We couldn't get it right. The first thing we did was just had an arm that came up. Well, no good because it threw the turn the tone arm off. We need to have a linear motion. So there had to be like an eccentric cam in there that lifted it. And they didn't, they're like, we're not building it. I'm like, all right, cop out at the last time. <laughs> at the last minute, you know, the last part we need. And they, they, I went there. They didn't say anything for a couple of days. So I went back and they go, I'm like, yeah. They did it. So we built everything, the tone arm, all the way down to the wow. to, to the lifter, the platter. We did everything. 
I see that. You could have branded that, right? Well, you know, I could have. And the funny part about it was, I just wanted one. They're like, Sam, we have we, everything's on CAD now. Do you want six? I'm like, no, I don't want six. There you go. <laughs> Seriously, it's like a couple hundred bucks more for material. We could do six. I'm like, ah, I don't want six. And we built six. Because and they were very. You had, a, you had a very interesting connection with like an Art Deco kind of very modern. Well, that, Art Deco and modern. If you can put those together, you know what like, my our my style I think is uh, like. We were trying to figure it out because it's kind of Scandinavian and Asian. Okay. So we're like, how about Scandinavian? Is it and minimalist? I think it's minimalist, but not cold. I think like you know my buildings and the things I do. I think you could be minimalist without being ice cold. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes super minimal spaces don't feel warm. No, they don't feel not inviting. At all. So the goal has always been to keep it minimal, but have enough warmth in it that it doesn't feel like you're you know in an ice in an ice cube. Understood. Oh man, I'll find it here in a second. That's all right. But anyway, so that's what happened. Is like, it was just a lot of fun to do it. And uh, when it was done, I ended up only getting one. To I only ended up having one working because I bought a bunch of motors for it from China. Okay. And they all burned out, and it was then the project just got swept off to the side for the next you know fifteen years. How did you find time to do that too? Well, you know, when we had the place in Bellevue, we were only open four days. Right. So I did have an extra day. I had, you know, three days off. So there was time. Okay. And it was fun. Once the, once the machine shop uh, ended up latching on to the project, it ended up being a lot of fun. I think they ended up enjoying it. They ended up telling me it was probably one of the best, okay. one of the most fun they had. <sighs> so it's not, it's just mostly. Oh, did you I get lost it? it. I, I lost it. I already got it. Is that an iPhone? No. Oh, good. I should be able to do it then. Look at that. That is so ultra modern. Yeah. Well, it's more functional. So it's a. Vi we'll zoom in on that too. That <laughs> so, is just. So the cool thing about it, like you can. That's so, ultra modern though. But but actually, what a turntable's job is to eliminate all extraneous vibrations from getting to that needle. So you can do it a couple of ways. You can do it with mass, real heavy things. Yeah. Or you can do it like uh, like the Danish do, uh, oh. uh, real light. So this is just a very heavy, super high mass. What's that unit you know, weigh? Oh, it weighs a lot. Like that's solid aluminum platter on there, like literally solid aluminum. And that's probably a good 50 pounds. And that really, you did all this really before the vinyl craze really hit. You know, I think that vinyl, if you were an audiophile, you never really got out of vinyl. Okay. You know, audiophiles have always been into vinyl. It seems like a lot of these young younger guys coming up, they just took they just took to vinyl again. I mean, vinyl is one hundred percent all the Analog. information that yeah, all the information that you record is on there. Right on a CD, they lop off the oh, super highs and the no super doubt. lows. So, Especially the early CDs are shitty. Yeah, because yeah, absolutely, they were just taking too much information away. So all those harmonics and all that right. stuff that was happening in the highs and the lows were gone. Right, and you were just getting real clean music. Which kind of sounded good until you heard real music, and real music. There was a warmth to analog. Yes, and, and and people say, "Oh, poo, they poo poo it," until they I, hear it. Well, I heard it when CDs were in their infancy, and I had a friend of mine who was an, an analog nut, and he a B'd something for me. I think it was a Miles Davis CD. Oh, same same song on. CD. And then played it on, and it was there was a warmth there. And he tried to explain, you know, you're hearing ones and zeros and bits lined up as opposed to the analog wave. And, dude, it's so much warmer. But you could hear it. Now, I know oversampling is so supposedly great now that they claim you can't hear it. And maybe that's true. It could be true. I mean, technology has come a long way. But early on, though, it was very visible. Yeah, whatever you played was directly recorded onto that album so you didn't including tape hiss which is part of the all whole of thing, it right? yeah, part of the whole thing yeah like like when you're going to listen to music in a, in a bar or at a club or even in a everywhere there's there's stuff happening it's not just it's organic so, yes exactly yeah and so if you grow up listening to digital you know as black as background music like younger kids are not just sitting in front of a stereo listening to music which i do i mean i'll put some nice music on and i'll mm. just sit right at the sweet spot and listen to music mm -hmm. And I think you're starting to get some of that back again. I'm starting to see some homes now where you might have a li maybe room this big is just a listening room. It's not a TV in there. Right. You know, just go there and listen to music. Yeah. So there is a little bit of a caveat though, and that when you go into whether it's Barnes and Nobles or where you go into, a, I guess there's FYE stores or still something. When you go into a media store in a mall and you see all the albums lined up. 
you have to be careful because these albums were pressed off of digital masters. So they're not like they're not cut. They're not pulling it off the original analog master. Uh, Do you see what I mean? So you're but still getting a digital sound. I noticed it with the Zeppelin stuff because, to my understanding, when Jimmy Page went in and took all the Zeppelin catalog and digitized it back in 90 and again like in 2004, it sounds great, but if you but they're also not pressing this vinyl stuff. And mm -hmm. I found out the vinyl is just a replication of the 04 Digital Master. Oh, so you're it still getting a digital a It's digital not signal. the analog... It's not the analog master ah. from the early Zeppelin stuff. So is it really is it really pure analog? Yeah. You, what experience are you getting outside of watching the thing go round and round? It's kind of interesting because I mean, you know, when Elvis and all those guys were first coming up, they'd literally go to a hotel room with a, a cutter. A four track. A cutter. Oh, like they would yeah, cut yeah, the yeah. album yeah, right there. You're right. They would literally play it and it would cut right onto the vinyl. It's nuts. That's so cool. And it was so real. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. I think a lot of time, a lot of what you're missing is just you don't get all that extra. Uh, I don't know, air and, and headroom and space. Yeah, because they cut that off. It takes too much space on a CD. Mm -hmm. Like all those harmonics that happen, it takes up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. A lot of data. A lot of data. So you can cut those off, and still, it sounds really good until mm -hmm. you hear it for real, and then you're mm -hmm. like, oh, sounds a little sterile. There was a friend of mine who had a, I don't, I don't know what Steely Dan album it was, but he had it on Reel to Reel. Oh, I had a bunch of Reel to Reels. And he played Reel to Reel for me, and I listened to Kid Charlemagne, and I swear on my kids, which is one of my favorite songs, I sat there in his living room, and I'm sure it was acoustically set up right. This guy was, did not play around. Yeah, he knew what he was doing, right. And I heard things in that song. There were, In that particular song, Kid Charlemagne, there is a synthesizer note that is so low it's almost inaudible but you that felt is, it you felt it and it's very hard to pick up on the digital the digital version yeah, because of they're that, cutting but, that off but man when you uh, i'm like wow that note is more prominent than yeah anything i've ever heard prior right. that note's a integral part of that song well i mean bass tones are more it's more of a feeling there's some stuff that you unless you're in the room you can't appreciate that bass note because right. you know like a 10 hertz bass note right. you can't really hear it but you're gonna feel it yeah and that's what makes it feel i think alive. that's what that it, so it made that wonderful song that was so special in my life even more amazing right in that one moment mm -hmm. where i was like wow i'm hearing things i have never heard before that's absolutely true i mean you're gonna hear stuff because again they they lop it off they, they don't have that space on that cd to do all that so mm -hmm. that's interesting I, I don't know vinyl is interesting the fact that it's still like you see a lot of young bands now they're doing vinyl and a cd and whatever yeah i just wanted the vinyl though and it depends on how they're going to record their that's a good point like you know i mean i think there's a i think there's still people out there like they're the, using tape in the studio there's still I, I, th I think if i was told also sam there's only one company that actually still makes the analog tape the actual tape yeah they monopolized it because they saw that there were some artists that wanted to do that they want to be the only source for that's it. pretty cool like i had a bunch of tape players man i had some beauties too man it's just really yeah oh my god i've sold so many tape players reel to reel was a special thing i kept one i kept one that goes with the spec system so i have one yeah, pioneer, pioneer that goes spec. in the rack yeah and that's the only one i kept i've sold dozens you know i just tapes are fantastic i love them. i know the degradation is tough to guard against it though. really is well you know uh bitches brew yeah he that was they were experimenting they were they were running tapes backwards back then that's crazy so all those sounds that you heard on there that was all shit that they might have made a little box to make this chirper you know now it's all in one keyboard but back yeah. then every individual oh. sound had its own little box to make that sound you know, when it was starting to digital. When, when i think about how amazing like some of the early recordings are like i, I always come back to pink floyd dark side of the moon oh. that in 73 that was and that was i think it was one of the alan parsons produced that i think but, but whoever produced that album in 73 was so far ahead of their time that that original recording, not any remasters, the original recording is so good, so loud, so non-period, if it makes sense, because yeah. all the Zeppelin stuff sounded like shit. Good, great music, but the quality yeah, wasn't there. That's, and it was available. Right. You know, you, you can listen to some 78s, and this sounds, because nobody ever believes me, but you get a good, clean 78, and you play it on the right equipment, if you think about a tape, the faster it goes, the cleaner it is. Right. Because you're stretching that sound over 
Same with the 78. Right. I have heard 78s that will blow your mind. I bet. Because the same thing. So that one, that's, that uh, signal was stretched out because it was going so fast. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't all jumbled up. Mm-hmm. So it's insane. So the idea of fidelity and all of that stuff, it, it's, it, it's ancient. That's, that's nothing new. No. You know, the same uh, 20,000 to, to 20 to 20,000 hertz right. has always been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it was able to be played back on some very ancient equipment. Like some of the old stuff. And, they in had, full range. In full range. It, you know, some of the stuff they had playing in theaters back then. Oh, my God. Some of the stuff coming from Germany. Like they had speakers the size of that wall that you never even noticed, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's insane. And I think, you know, people look back and say, ah, oh, it's a 78. Nah, that shit is good, man. The digital was not, and as a musician, as a guitar player, I can tell you um and i'm not in tune the past 10 years probably with all the digital effects and all that they i hear they're amazing the oversampling well, rates are so sound, high you can sample anything you know yeah yeah but there's just something organic for, for me in the years that i played I, I you know i i i may have had a uh, a chorus pedal or something but i wanted to plug my guitar straight into a marshall mm-hmm. find my tone you know no no um digital anything and I wanted to use the cable, didn't want any wireless. I want everything to be organic mm-hmm. because to me, I could hear the difference. It was pure. There was an organic juiciness to that that, again, you might not be explaining to a kid today, but for me, the analog signal was just so beautiful. And a tube amp. I mean, those oh, little tube. Oh, a tube, yeah. I mean, nat- Marshall, natural sure. distortion. Rainy. Yeah. Natural. You know, you could just, oh. you, you couldn't overdrive a tube amp. It just will distort beautifully. It's and, warm, uh, it's, and you can make it as crunchy as you want. But yeah, and and so you know, technology has not always been music's friend, right? Well, especially when you don't have to have any talent now. I, mean, I can go into <laughs> you can go into a studio and have someone you play don't with say you, you go into a studio and have someone with a bunch of uh, you know auto tune on there, and next thing you know, it sounds like you have a song, but there's nothing to it there's no soul to it it's just well, they're a, trying to monetize they're yeah. trying to make their hit yeah to make their money yeah mm. it's it's interesting it's like some of this new music i'm like it just <laughs> sounds exactly the same <coughs> nothing is original anymore i mean like the 90s i thought was very good pearl jam and those guys i love that era those guys were stone good temple music- pilots early they, 90s they were good musicians they were actually <coughs> well the grunge thing i mean i've thought i've said it before i i, I didn't believe in grunge to me Nirvana was an outlier. I can't say I got them, but the rest of that stuff was just rock and roll to me. Mm-hmm. That was the progression of rock and roll, mm-hmm. and it was dressing down and not doing the flamboyance of the 80s, but you know, it just the image changed, but the music was great. It was really good. Thoughtful, well well crafted as I say. Meaningful. Yeah, I mean, you know, some of that stuff I just I just it's so cliché to like it, I guess, but I love that. I love that era. It's a mm-hmm. good era. It reminds me a little bit of the stuff that we grew up with it was you know it was thoughtful there wasn't a bunch of electronic shit happening no and it was real organic and if you know uh if if you think about you know periods of music like the punk movement happened and i wasn't a big fan of it when it happened it kind of grew on me later the punk movement was there to shake up the industry yeah nirvana shook up the entire oh, industry awesome. they basically that hair metal 80 stuff that was very commercial and like, look, we're not playing this shit. This is what we're doing. It shook the industry up, and I think that's good. It's really good. Whether you like it or not, it's good. Yeah, especially if the industry is heading toward, like, sameness, where everything is just the same. Like, like the old school rap I liked when it was melodical and sort of poetic, and now it just sounds all the same to me. It, to me. I mean, I'm, Yeah, vocal styles are the same, and it, the subject's the same. It's just not... You not know, interesting like, to um, me. Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill Gang. That I still was, have that in my car right now. And it's, so not, it's not politically correct to play Apache anymore, but what a great song <laughs> that is. That's awesome. Yeah, and, it's, and this, the sampling thing, you know, because they sampled, right? They sampled Good yep. Times by Chic. Yep. And they sampled a couple other songs. So the sampling was always a part of rap. So it was never truly original, per se. But, right, because that, that was the backdrop for it. Yeah, but everything's just now is so... And it could be because we're getting older and our, we've heard so much. But yeah, maybe. It sounds the same. It really does to me. The originality issue isn't really there. Well, I don't, I don't know if there's even a passion. I just think, like you said, I can go on right now and digitize my voice and, you know, get it out there. And if it's got a, the right beat, 
It's everyone likes it. <laughs> yeah, know? it's about the it's about the beat and, yeah. the, and the voice and whether you can carry a tune is irrelevant because when you throw it through auto tune, it's amazing. Doesn't what can, matter. What can be done? Doesn't matter. You can look at Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> Sorry, Oz, but I mean, like, he's been using auto tune for as long as it's been around. Yeah, smart. It's cool. I I, I just enjoy I just enjoy music. I, I'm not genre specific. Like yeah. I said, if I hear something that has talent behind it and it's well crafted, I'm, I'm okay with it. Buddy, this was great. Thank you, man. We need to do this again. I'm in. Yeah, for sure. I, this is long overdue for me. <laughs> and thank you for being a word. Uh, thank you for being a voice of encouragement for me when I came to you with this idea. Because, you know, it was uh, it was a stretch for a lot of people. But um, you looked at me and go, just do it. Yeah. We sat in your patio over there, Vivo, before you opened one day, and go, yeah, just do it. I mean, See what happens. Just do it. You already had a job. You had income. There was yeah. no there was no real risk no for downside, you. downside, right? So you lose. I mean, all right. Do you want to lose 10 grand? Of course not. But 10 grand you lose is not going to change your life. It doesn't mean you don't no. eat. It doesn't mean you don't have a house. Uh, use it to have some fun. Exactly. I tell everybody that. You know, like, you know, so it's going to cost you five grand. Let's say you lose it. Do you yeah. stop living? Then right. no, don't do it. Yeah. But if you have five grand and you want to try something you've always wanted to do, Fucking do it. <laughs> yeah, and if not now, when, right? When? Look at this, huh? Next God week. bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Sandy Batista, Vivo Restaurant Swickly. You gotta go. You gotta go. Get takeout for now, but as soon as they open up again, it's an experience. You have to experience it. And special love to your wife, Lori, too, because she's in it with you. Yeah. 100%. Without her, I'm not sure what happens. So. Amen to that. Thank you, my friend. Welcome. All right. We are out. Uh, All right, bud. That was awesome. You have fun? I don't have fun.